important for us because it, this is a home race, only one shot for Aston Martin and between uh, 15 and maybe 20 cars can win the race. We would like to, to do a good uh, result and good performance here. Welcome back to the Blancpain Endurance Series to Duncan Tappy. He missed Monza while he was hunting for a deal, but Duncan, who finished last season with a win at Navarra for McLaren, is now at Mercedes. He drives for the Black Falcon Racing Team, he's in the Pro-Am class, and he is going to be one of the fastest drivers in the category. It means the world to me to be back racing in the Blancpain Endurance Series. It's the biggest and best GT Championship in the world, I think, at the moment, so it's uh, where all us racing drivers want to be. Another star of Monza was Alex Buncombe. Once again, he proved the pace of the Nissan in the Italian race in the opening round of the championship. And although he had a brake problem here early on Saturday, Alex was fastest in Q3. And once again, this car is going to be one to watch when we go racing. Well, you know, what more can I say, but what a fantastic series, you know. Um, amazing cars, amazing drivers, um, amazing circuits to boot. So um, what more could I want as a racing driver? Alex Buncombe is on the outside of the front row of the grid, but unlike Monza, he will go last in that car. He will do the third stint. It's going to be Lucas Ordonev who will go first. The pole-sitting car, Darren Turner, is going to be the man behind the wheel. Well, let's first of all go down to the grid and join John Watson, who's at the front of the grid. Darren, can the Aston Martin dazzle here this afternoon? I hope so. Fingers crossed, yeah. I mean, um, we've always had a very good racing if it's GT1 or GTE and obviously the GT3 today so um, the sort of I don't know the, the sort of uh, DNA of the car is suited to, to this circuit medium high-speed corner so um, you know Freddie did a great job in qualifying getting the, the Aston Martin on on pole position so uh, it's down to me to do a good start and make sure I hand over in a, a reasonably good position for Freddie and Stefan later in the race. You're gonna to have to do something special on the track because pit stops are probably not the strength of the team at the minute Nice, um, you know, maybe a bit of a, a weak point at the moment is that the, I think it's the wheel nut design. Um, the whole point of the, the wheel nut on this car was it was designed for the championships where pit stops aren't about speed, they're a sort of allocated time. Um, so in relation to the very best guys out there, we're probably going to lose between five to sort of seven seconds of pit stop. There's only two pit stops, so worst case is 14 seconds, so hopefully we can, uh, we can gain that back on the track somehow. So you're in the car now, head down. Flat out for the first stint. Yeah, um, but it's obviously first time for us doing the Blancpain Championship, and um, you know I don't even know some of the guys and cars and teams around me, so uh, I just want to make sure I get a, a good couple of clean laps at the start, and then uh, get my head down. And uh, if I can get a gap, great. But um, you know, main thing is to, just to uh, pass the car over in one piece when it comes round to the pit stops. Get into the car, enjoy it. Thanks very much. Cheers, John. Thanks. John Watson down on the grid. We'll hear from Jack Nichols during the race itself from the pit lane. This is David Addison looking down on what is a full grid. We have got 57 cars. We lost one yesterday because Kuhn Wouters had a very big accident in his McLaren and that didn't destroy it, but it certainly put it the wrong side of being able to be repaired. That's the pole sitting car. Darren Turner will go first. Extraordinary to think that after all the GT racing Darren has done, we've never actually had him in block pound before kind of had it in my mind that he must have done at least one race but it's not that and so this is his debut from pole position Fred Makaviki having done the time unusually the time coming from Q2 uh, rather than Q3 when the cars are at their lightest and it's going to be the same order for them in terms of driver rotation in the race Darren then Fred Makaviki then Stefan Mucha this is a car that's second on the grid Lucas Ordonev is going to do the first stint Lucas remember the first winner of the couch to cockpit competition that Nissan promotes with PlayStation, the PlayStation GT Academy and then it's going to be one of the more recent winners from last year, Peter Pizzera to go second Alex Buncombe will do that last stint the second row of the grid is where you'll find the best Audi, the Frank Stippler Edward Sandstrom, Christopher Mies Belgian Audi Club, uh, Team WRT car, but let's just go back to Nissan for a moment and hear from Peter Pizzera about to go racing, he's with John Watson Peter Pizzera, you're going to be second in the Nissan this afternoon, excited about it? Yeah, I'm very excited to drive in the second position. You see we are very front in the grid, second place. Uh, it will be a hard and good race, and I'm very excited to be in the second driver position. So what are you looking for Lucas to do? Bring this car in what position do you anticipate? Yeah, I hope he will get in front, maybe, and uh, get the first position. Maybe get some gap between the other cars, and uh, hopefully we got in the pit stop and we can yeah, continue like this. Are you going to have to be easy in the throttle? I hear the Nissan likes the petrol a bit too much. Yeah, of course, the Nissan uh, likes the petrol more than the other cars. So we need a little bit more time in the pit to refuel the car. 
but uh, we can hopefully gain this time on the track. Well, enjoy it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Peter Pazzera does know Silverstone to an extent because as part of that Nissan PlayStation Academy last year there is a shootout race on the Grand Prix circuit here. Uh, so he will have raced in that in a rather different type of Nissan, a rather more standard 370Z. And there you can see the Christopher Meese Audi that will start third on the grid. And to its left is the best of the Ferraris which is going to be started by Alexander Scriabin. Qualified though by Alessandro Pierguidi in the very rapid Italian. Did his, did his usual amazing job to put that car up at the pointy end of the grid down from the BRDC clubhouse which overlooks the stadium in other words Brooklands and Luffield and Woodcut corner there we have the back of the grid all formed and I've just mentioned Alessandro Pierguidi who did a great job to qualify the car third he is with John Alessandro second row of the grid for the Ferrari what have you told your teammates to do well yes I think the second row is okay for the Ferrari is not the favorite track this one Aston is really, really fast, but we have a good pace, I think, in the race. And um, after the pole in Monza, second row here is very good for us. And we see the race, but I think the team uh, make uh, a good job and we'll do at the end. Very, very close grid. 26 cars covered by just a second. Yes, everybody are really fast in this championship. Is uh, I think it's the best championship in Europe at the moment. And uh, to be in the second, uh, second row, it's... Uh, I'm proud about that. So are you going to be second or third driver for this car? I will be the third driver. All the pressure's on you then, isn't it? <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> but I think we'll see. I, I do my best. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the usual plan for these teams to have their quickest driver in at the end, because if you have a late race safety car, then you will need that fastest driver to be there. You don't want the slower guy in because they're going to get mugged. So it makes sense to put Pierre Guidi in at the very end there. Again, Nissan lining up fifth. This car was quickest yesterday evening in pre-qualifying. It's the Peter Dumbrecht started Lucas Law, Stephen Kane car. And we know how quick Lucas is from his FIA GT1 days in Nissan's Peter Dumbrecht, Stephen Kane. Very, very good driver combination there. And Nissan have been testing since Monza and reckon they've made a step forward for this weekend. And you've got two Nissans in the top five on the grid. So it's looking pretty good, you've got to say. And then for sixth on the grid is going to be uh, the Porsche decided by Eric Dermont. This is Stefan Ortelli's car, and let's go to the grid and hear from Vincent Voss. Vincent, very, very tense moments on the grid right now. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's the best grid I've ever seen so far. So, uh, and for us, it works quite well. We did third, third eighth, and ten positions, so we're quite pleased with the teamwork. And uh, now, cross our finger and see what's going on at the start. Now, your team manager, what have you told Christian Mees to do? Well, I, most of the time I told them to go as quick as possible. <laughs> but second row of the grid, strong position for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, we see that uh, in, in, in Monza when you start 15 or 18, it's, it's getting very, very difficult. So we, we've been pushing a bit harder in qualifying to be more to the front. And also Silverson seems to suit our idea a little bit better than Monza. Oh, for sure it suits better than Monza, but uh, Monza, I think, was the worst place for us. So now we go to some track which suit a bit better to the Audi. You better get back and tell your drivers to behave. Thank you. It's not just Vincent's drivers that need to behave, it's everybody around you, and this is one of the problems. You ask a driver, does qualifying for a three-hour race matter? And increasingly they say yes, because you want to be near the front and therefore away from that potential drama in the mid-pack. You don't want to get caught up in traffic because that is going to ruin your race early on. The race director, Bernard Cottrell, laid down the law very sternly at Monza and we got through the first hour and a bit without any dramas whatsoever. Well, there, of course, there is that tight first chicane. Here, there is Cops flowing right-hander, Beckett's S's flowing sequence of corners. So, in theory, it should be even easier to get through the first lap unscathed, but I say that is the theory. So, the grid is formed. You're looking towards the back of the grid there at the slower Gulf Racing McLaren, and that's going to be the car in the hands of Mike Wainwright and Andy Merrick and you have to say that McLaren has had an absolutely shocking qualifying session the cars did not look quick they did not look balanced and one had an accident yesterday the sister car had a big crash this morning John Hartzell put it off the road and all of the McLarens have just looked uneasy on the circuit they haven't looked as though they've had the balance and therefore they can't get the speed out of the cars whether anything magic has happened since qualifying which ended at 10 o'clock I rather doubt could be that McLaren here plays a bit part in the story but let us wait and see the grid now being cleared and as the drivers then are getting set 
the John Hartshorn McLaren I've just been mentioning will be at the back of the grid. So let's have a look at who is there. That's the second row, Audi and Ferrari. Row three, you'll find Nissan on the left, Eric Dermont's Porsche on the right. Go back a row, Davide Rigon starts and the Monza winning Ferrari, Stefan Ortelli alongside him. Then it's Bass Linders up against the pit wall in the BMW, Eugenio Amos alongside in the Ferrari that had brake problems at Monza. Rahel Fry starts number two, Steve Jans in the Mercedes alongside. Enzo Ida is next in Audi 16, six will be started alongside by Harold Primat. Then this is Mark Poole going first in his Aston Martin with Mark Hayek for company. Then it is Oliver Morley and Stefano Colombo. And we go through the rest of the grid just a touch quicker, picking out Fortex white Mercedes, Blancpain debut there. To the right is the Hexis McLaren, a long, long way back. ART Grand Prix McLarens further back than they wanted to be as well. Pro Speed's Porsche is going to be started by Mark Henarici, and that is another car much further back on the grid than you expect to find it. And as the grid approaches Woodcut Corner. More McLarens near the back, more BMWs, including the Royal Racing Car 43, the white McLaren, the white BMW rather than Michele Ciruti. And we're almost there. Nero Konopka's Porsche to the left. And right at the very back should be number 15 to be started by Karim Oje, the car crashed by John Hartshorn. And Peter Cox quoted as saying just pre-race that they're not concerned about tyre degradation. Marbles and pickup will not be a concern. So he runs the Pirelli Rover, on which everybody runs this year. He's going to be OK for the stint. We've heard Darren Turner just talk to John Watson on the grid and mention the fact there are only two pit stops. Well, that's the regulation two pit stops. And you'll try and do those as close to the hour mark as possible and therefore avoid a splash and dash late in the race. Of course, if you have a problem, then yes, you are going to have to make another pit stop and that suddenly costs you a whole heap of time which you do not want to be losing. So, away they go, 57 cars we have ready for round two of the Blancpain Endurance Series, and one of them's a bit slow away, which is Rob Barth's McLaren, but he's got going now. Everybody works their way down towards Cops Corner, and this amazing series that just goes from strength to strength yet again, generating this enormous grid. We lost a McLaren yesterday, we lost a couple of cars in the week uh, because of damage from a British GT race here last weekend that just was not able to be repaired in time. It could have been even bigger, and number 15 is at the back of the grid, despite the damage this morning of Carrie Moje. Well, Silverstone is a regular visit for the Blancpain Endurance Series. It came here for the last round in 2011. It came here for a wet race last year. And now, in the sunshine, let's have a look at the grid. We've seen it car by car, driver by driver. Darren Turner will start with Lucas Ordonev lining up alongside him at the front of the grid. The second row, Christopher Mies and Alexander Skriabin. So that means it's Audi and Ferrari. Then Nissan and Porsche, where you find Peter Dumbrack and Eric Dermel lining up alongside each other. Davide Rigon comes next for Ferrari. Stefano Telli will be alongside him. The fifth row, Bass Linders starts for BMW. Eugenio Amos next for Ferrari. Rahul Fry, Audi number two. Steve Jans in the Black Falcon, Mercedes car number 18. Two more Audis come next. Enzo Ida in number 16. And Harold Primat, the Swiss driver, goes first in six. The eighth row of the grid, Mark Poole. Quick gentleman racer starts in number 180 Aston, run by Barwell and Mark Hayek in the in the Lamborghini alongside. Then Oliver Morley and Stefano Colombo ahead of Vitor Scheiter and Charles Bateman in the second of the JRM Nissan. Stephen Jelly goes to Mercedes for the weekend and he will line up alongside Henri Moser, who wasn't here yesterday, who was finishing off his law exam. Michael Ammermuller in number 40, Alexander Sims in the troubled Hexis McLaren. Then it's Boris Ruttenberg and Antoine Leclerc starting in the McLaren for ART on row 13 of the grid. Row 14 is where you find Eric Clement and Mark Henarici Porsches, both ahead of Nick Homerson and Daniel McKenzie, again going first for Beach Team. Then it is Gerhard Traraza in the Lamborghini, Rob Barth for Von Rahn Racing, ahead of Rob Bell, a long, long way down in the Gulf Racing McLaren, and Wolfgang Reip alongside another of the PlayStation Academy graduates. Henry Hasse shares row 18 with Phil Driver. The 19th row of the grid, Rodan Younesi alongside uh, Ruslan Tisplakov. And then row 20 of the grid is where you find Gabriel Balthazar and Gregoire de Moustier, class winner at Navarra at the end of last season. Row 21, Ferrari and BMW, Dennis Anderson lines up alongside Michele Ciruti. Row 22 is the soft rev Ferrari of Jean-Luc Blanchemin and Mike Wainwright's Gulf Racing McLaren ahead of Ahmad al Hathi in the ARC Bratislava Porsche and Alexander Froloff. They are ahead of Felipe Barreros and Luke Payab. On row 24, row 25 is Godfrey Jones starting in the family Mercedes of Romain Monti. Next up, row 26, Jean-Marc Bachelier and the Sport Garage Ferrari of Johnny-Georges Caban alongside. And still they come. Row 27, 
Pierre Hershey will go first in the Santelot Audi. Christophe Lujan alongside Andras Josefsson lines up alongside Christian Kelders on row 28. And at the back, Karim Auger in a car that did hardly any laps in qualifying the surviving Boussum Gignon McLaren. That is your 57 cars. Three hours in prospect, John Watson. This, as ever, is something to savour. It is amazing. A lot of energy on the grid. The circuit looks stunning. A beautiful day at Silverstone, Sunside, a little bit of high cloud. 57 cars on the grid. 26 of them within one second in qualifying. The opening laps, let alone the lap, are going to be amazing. We're about to go racing. It is time for a very deep breath, not only in terms of describing the first few corners, but I suspect there's a sharp intake of breath in race control as well, because the race director is hoping that everybody gets through this first lap like they did at Monza, to be fair to the guys, without any drama whatsoever. It is Darren Turner who lines up on pole position. He's got Lucas Ordonieth alongside him. In theory, Darren Turner should grab the lead, but let's see. We go racing at Silverstone. Lights out. Down towards Cops Corner they go, and a good start is made by Darren Turner, but Lucas Ordonieth in the Nissan comes up on the outside, and Alexander Skriabin tries to go with them in the Ferrari. They pour their way into Cops Corner. On board with Bass Linders in BMW number three. Power on up towards Magnus for the first time. They've all got through Cops safe and sound. And now as they work their way towards Beckett's then, it's a very good start that's put Lucas Ordonieth into the lead. Darren Turner slips back into second place. Grab his third in the Ferrari. Yeah, the front of the Nissan into Cops just came at the advantage over Darren Turner. Sensibly, Darren didn't try and make an issue of it. He let the Nissan take the lead. It's a long race this afternoon. That Aston has got good pace. They've worked very, very hard to get a balance in the car from fuel to empty tanks. Snow corner, lap one, field pouring through, including 57 there, Eugenio Amos. And one of the Mark VDS BMWs running us a little bit wide there, but drivers hunting not just for an apex but for track position look at that million euro car park almost a mobile showroom of supercars pouring through yeah the, the opening laps of the front three rows of the grid they're pretty much lined to stern but beyond that all the way back down to what was the 28th row of the grid it's just as you say a traveling car park it'll take three or four laps for it to resolve itself for drivers to get over the nerves somebody runs very <laughs> wide coming the middle of club one of the Porsches that's Ahmed al Hardy, the Amar driver, and he can't get back on, there's no room, there's all this traffic. Well, there was, certainly was talk about abuse of the racetrack. <laughs> Look at the abuse coming through the exit of club. Three cars, more than one car width off the racetrack. That'll not be a problem at this point, but if they persist in doing that through the race, then they will get notice to stop doing it. I'll tell you what, there's an awful lot of land owned by the BRDC, the owners of Silverstone, and there isn't enough of it to accommodate the cars because they're everywhere. Lap one, out of entry, down towards Brooklyn's they come, and this is the leader, Lucas Ordonieth, ahead of Darren Turner. Behind them is Alexander Skriabin, who's got Ferrari Challenge experience, but really, he's not done a huge amount of racing at this level, and he's doing a very good job on this opening lap of the race. Yes, he's retained his position on the grid, but he was third yesterday, Audi in fourth, Christopher Meese in fourth position. And we have a little look as they come through. This is the tail end of the field coming through. Woodcut just across the start finish line. Bass Linders, you're on board with. And where is he at the end of lap number one? Ninth, just ahead of the 57 Ferrari, which is started by Eugenio Amos. There is the man that was on, or the car rather, that was on pole position here last year when Frank Keckler did the time. Stefano Colombo is at the wheel of it, but admitting Frank Keckler to me this morning, the BMW is just not as quick as last year. Now we're back on board with Bass Linders, and he's getting very busy because ahead of him is Eric Demont in the Porsche, and he's holding up the BMW, and a bit of bodywork has just gone flying off a car coming past the pits. It's offline as we're riding with Linders. Yeah, Linders is trying to take a position coming down. What was the fastest part of the racetrack? That is the hangar straight, no longer the case. So it's Porsche versus BMW, BMW on the inside. Bass Linders makes a very straightforward, almost a gift to him in the BMW. Winners here last year, remember that car? They had a good battle for the first two hours with Audi, and then in the last stint, they put Maxime Martin in the BMW. Nobody really saw him again, he just drove off into the distance, as is his wont. So, we're on lap two, three-hour race, don't forget, two mandatory pit stops. What is going to happen in this second round of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series? Ferrari up at the top, not quite at the sharp end, but they're in that leading group, but it's a different team running the car from the Monza winning one. This is SMP Racing for Alexander Skriabin, as against Kessel Racing. That's that bit of bodywork I mentioned that flew off coming past the pits, and the marshals quickly on the scene to retrieve that. It came off one of the Santelot cars, I think, as we've got this right old scrum heading into Villa. Audi versus Ferrari, and again, that's Eugenio Amos looking to try to get back his place and tucked up behind his Enzo Eder in the Audi. It's very, very easy as you come through the complex one, farm curve up to village, then into the loop. Out of village, you can take a look down the inside into the loop, you compromise your exit, allows the car to make a switch back, but you know, it, it's still so early in this race. It's more about getting 
feel for the car, the feel for your tyres, not overdriving, not making I mean, a premature a move that's not very well judged, then they don't come to you. Getting news also that Wolfgang Reib's Nissan has lost some bodywork on the opening lap, but this is the leading Nissan. It is Lucas Ordonev, Darren Turner is behind him, and let's just see what the gap is between the pair of them now. It is a tenth of a second or so, sorry, nine tenths of a second, I should say, as they uh, came over the timing line, and there in trouble is number six, and that to be started by Harold Primat. Indeed, so he's been off track. In the meantime, the first two cars are trading fastest times in the individual sectors, so they've got a small gap. Well, it's three seconds between first and third, the lead Ferrari. And here you've got Eugenio Amos trying to get himself past Porsche, but also in this little group, he's number two, Rahul Frey. So three different types of car all running together. They come onto Hangar Straight absolutely as one. Down towards Stoke Corner. And side by side, Eric Dermott under attack now. Rahul Frey to the inside in the out. As you can't get through, though, the door is slammed in her face. Very cautious. He could have been a bit more forceful. Could have stuck the idea down a bit deeper. He now is under threat from behind, so in that cautious move, he's opened up the door for a challenge from the car back next up. And so as they come out of club corner past the Silverstone wing, we are currently working lap number three. Remember, it's Lucas Ordonez leading from Darren Turner and Alexander Striabin, dropping the race of his life in third ahead of Christopher Meese. And then in fifth place at the moment, in 23, is Peter Dumbrecht. Now this is what happened at Brooklands on the first lap. Harold Primat getting shoveled aside. And that was by a rather aggressive Victor Shaita. And so around goes the alley, just missed by Ori Moser. That might get looked back to the stewards, that was an avoidable incident. You know, you've got to give a car working room if you know it's there, if you don't know it's there, well, that was the penalty, so uh, it may be looked at by the stewards, but in these opening laps, I think there's a little bit... This, well, contact between car 71 and number 6 has been reported at turn 6, so consequently, that's why we got the repeat of it. And so the stewards will have a look at that, the race director keeping an eye to it as well, and as we've got the Big pack battling its way through Luffield. In number 13 is Christopher Meese. You've got Peter Dumbrecht right on his tail. So look at this, Ferrari, Audi, Nissan, Audi. Different types of car battling amongst themselves here. The balance of performance working nicely. The BMW is 10 kilos lighter coming into this weekend. The Mercedes 10 kilos lighter as well. And look at the different shapes as well. You've got the low-line Audi and then the Nissan sort of looming large over the top of it. Well, the Nissan is, in a sense, the true spirit of a GT car because you could actually put small-sized people, call them children if you wish, in the back of the Nissan, whereas everything else is a true two-seater GT car. But the Nissan is a physically much bigger car, but it's got a lot of performance. Team working very hard to get the balance of the handling right. They find they've got a lot of understeer entry, a lot of oversteer in the exit. They still got it sorted out for qualifying to be in the front row of the grid, though. Looking at the JRM run Nissan that's currently in the traffic, you're looking at the leading car being run by RJN, Bob Neville's team. Now, there is Bass Linders. Winner here last year, of course, in the equivalent race. He's in eighth place. You're riding with him, and ahead is Davide Rigo. We're at Monza. Yeah, indeed, and that Ferrari just really, once we got into the third hour, that was on challenge pretty much until the chequered flag came out. But Baz Linders, you know, he loves his motor racing, and he will challenge the Ferrari on a circuit that will suit the BMW. This is not good news, because this in the pit lane is Daniel McKenzie, and they're having a look in the, in the air intake by the look of it. It was quite a long way down, that Aston Martin, even after qualifying. The fight is on for third, fourth and fifth as they come up towards Village and Peter Dumbrecht goes to the outside line into the braking zone. Yeah, this is what you can do into Village and uh, then up into Luke Peter Dumbrecht. Tried to position himself to give him a chance to get past the Ferrari as Screamin. In fact, there's the idea of peace. Uh, so Peter Dumbrecht clearly has got a quicker package. Trying to maybe think about now coming down into Brooklyn. Now the quickest part of the racetrack down the Brooklyn. Uh, down that. Wellington straight. Wellington straight again. In to Brooklyn. Yes. Dumbrecht has a go to the inside, but it's the wrong line for Luffield. And look behind them, you've got Stefan Ortelli looking for a way by as well. And then the next pair closing up. Davide Rigon is taking with him. Bass Linders now. Yes. So we're seeing Alexander Screven falling back from the lead two cars and acting as almost like a mobile, slightly slower than maybe expected Ferrari. And the next five cars have all concentrated up into this chain of cars looking to find a way around the Ferrari. But isn't it fascinating the way the balance of performance works that you can create this traffic jam but it's then so hard to overtake because the cars are evenly matched and they work in some cases on the fast corners, in other bits on the straights and it all works so you get this long, long line. Yeah, I mean some cars will be more nimble than others, some have got slightly better performance versus the weight of the car, some have got slightly different aerodynamics. This is a much more aerodynamic circuit than the Monza. First round of the Blancpain Championship, the season Monza, traditionally a low downforce circuit, 
Here you've got high-speed challenging corners, which put a big, big emphasis on being able to get the car to stick to the racetrack. Blinders then sitting at the back of this little queue, he's in 8th place, ahead of him is Davide Rigon, still leading the way is Lucas Ordonieff, and he's still only 9 tenths up on the rest of them. This is Bass Linders' view, down through Vale, ahead of him is Davide Rigon, who's trying to line up to have a go on the inside, Rigon's target is Stefano Telli. Bass Linders is hard at work, the BMW is well suited to the circuit, it was a BMW that won last weekend's British 3-hour race, is that a good omen, I wonder, for Mark VDS Racing? Wide out of club and over the kerb, John. Yes, I mean, he doesn't put all four wheels over the kerb. Two is acceptable, four is unacceptable. And not a huge amount of difference between the speed of the Ferrari just ahead of David Rigo and uh, Baz Linders in the BMW. Linders goes far to the left, Regan covers on the inside, not to offer another chance. But again, slightly out of position as they come up to the loop, which is then the corner that is the penultimate corner before the quickest part of the straight. Quickest part of the circuit, the Wellington straight. Baz Linders not in a position to make much use of the, the BMW's performance right now. The Ferrari just edges away in terms of top speed at the quickest part of the circuit. Into Brooklyn, so Vinnie Regan goes a little bit wide into the corner, but he gets it across, doesn't he? He finds the apex. And he's, making, he's taking what I would call a more traditional racing line, whereas Baz Landers is looking for clear air and looking for an opportunity to make something out of what's going on with the cars ahead. Leaders have gone through, one second splits them, and then there's this big gap of over seven seconds before you get the third place Ferrari of Alexander Scriabin. Christopher Mies is next, then it's Dumbrecht, then it's Ortelli, then it's Regal, Linders, Line is Ryle Fry, and in tenth place there, Steve Jans in the Mercedes going very well. Now, Lucas Ordonieff, who leads overall, is also leading Pro Am because with Peter Pizzera in that car as a rookie driver that goes into Pro Am, Steve Jans in tenth place is currently second in the class and third in 18th place. Uh, is number 230 Nissan, Charles Bateman at the wheel of it. Interesting choice in that second, or the leading Nissan that they put. Uh, Peter Pazera in the car second, we thought maybe it would have been Alex Buncombe, but Alex Buncombe, the driver who led at Monza for the Bob Neville Nissan GT Academy team, uh, is in the car last, so they maybe think because of what's going to take place in the opening two hours, that Alexander Bunker might be able to scoop up a lot of places. Same with other teams, isn't it? Like Maxime Martin goes last for VDS, you want your quick guy in at the end. If you get a late race safety car, then he can do all that hard work rather than losing places. The leading McLaren, as far as I can work out, is 15th at the moment. Then it's Antoine Leclerc for ART Grand Prix. That's 77, which is uh, Rudin Younesi making his way through Woodcock Corner. New to European racing this year, doing block pan. He's just got himself a drive at Le Mans as well. And he had a spin, and that's why he's dropped quite a long way down to 54th place now. Yeah, and he ran wide coming out of wood, because he didn't need to run the, the curb at the outside, a little bit of pushing and shoving. And that's uh, Ortelli. Uh, yes. Ooh, and he's through, got past Dumbrecht, with his elbows out. He did, and uh, Peter Dumbrecht will not be very happy about that. And in fact, we tell that, look at Roba and I, look at Arega, I should say, Dumbrecht having to defend, coming down Wellington Strait into Brooklyn's. I mean, Arega was almost about to put the Nissan ahead of, uh, the Ferrari ahead of the Nissan. And two places lost and two corners would not be good in the CV, Peter Dumbrecht. Uh, very true indeed. And Davide Rigon is there. Look, tucked up behind him as the leader is now already in traffic. Henry Hassid is just being lapped there in the TDS BMW. That's obviously had a drama early on because it's a quick car. And Darren Turner had to get out of the throttle as the BMW swooped across the front of it, not being not fully aware that the Aston was that close behind. But this is drawn, in fact, Darren Turner slightly closer. The gap going across the line was just under four tenths of a second. So Darren Turner maybe has decided he's had enough of the fumes from the Nissan. He wants to get that Aston Martin into free, clean, fresh air. And as he was saying to you on the grid, they're going to lose about seven seconds at maximum on each stop. So the farther he is ahead of the next gang of cars behind, then he's got that safety margin in the pit stops. But like everybody, they're all trying to work around finding the sweet spot of the Pirelli tyre. And they've been using tyre pressures, mechanical things to get it. Fred Mack and Vicky told me as I walk back from the grid that they think they've got a pretty good race car. They've got a quick and a consistent race car, and that's what you're looking for. And you have to say, they've got three star drivers in it now. Scriabin is under attack, look, because Christopher Meese is bored and staring at the back of the Ferrari. This is at the end of Vale for third place. Don't forget, the leaders are long gone, but Scriabin is just there ahead now of Meese. And a bit of a gap is opening up because Dumbrecht's gone back into fifth place, I noticed, but in so doing, has lost time against those two. Meese got an advantage by running wide off club, trying to get the Audi not close enough to have a look down the inside into Abbey. It's such a high speed entry into Abbey, he had to back out of it, but he is on a charge. And Alexander Screeman is under pressure. 
a reason just going back to that Henry Hassid BMW that I said must have had a problem. It did. It had a right rear puncture. Beach Dean's Aston Martin is in because of a gearbox problem. And Rob Barth has brought in the Von Ryan McLaren. And that's also got a puncture. Disappointing. Disappointing. Great job from Rob Barth in Monza for the Von Ryan Racing McLaren. The gap between those six cars is now two, three groups of two cars, really more than one group of six cars. Durfin is on break, looking to try and claw back the position that he lost, or the position that he lost a few moments ago to that ID. So uh, again, under pressure from Mortelli. Well, there over the timing line is Ordon Yefon, how's Darren Turner getting on? He's 0.9 of a second behind him, and that last lap, he wasn't quite as quick, in fairness. In fact, I think, I think Dombrek has actually got past Ortelli. The last lap around it was Ortelli, no, Dombrek, that's right, that's correct. Yeah, he got past, but in doing yeah, that, yeah. he lost that time, didn't he, against Meese. Now there, Steve Jans, 10th, and he's got Eugenio Amos up behind him, and then ends up either having to be pretty defensive, look, because behind him is Victor Scheiter, and then you've got Stefano Colombo in 14th. Oh, and McLaren, we've seen one, 16th, Antoine Leclerc. Joking aside, John, this has been a horror day for McLaren. It's been an awful weekend, and even this morning we saw two of the McLarens off track, one in the barrier, another with seemingly losing a rear wheel. That may have been a consequence of contact, but the car, just some reason, and I'm absolutely perplexed, I do not understand, the car looks very difficult indeed for the drivers. In particular, we saw Alvaro Perez in the Hexus car coming through Beckett's this morning, qualifying and it was bouncing physically bouncing up and down on the edge of the corner and that car is being driven by alexander sims and it's 34th would you believe the hexes racing mclaren hexes a top gt team make no argument about that i mean work in progress that's all i can say winner of the last race at Navarra last year, how times change. This for third, fourth and fifth, Alexander Scriabin is still the cork in the bottle. As soon as they can get past him, then things are going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, Christopher Meese had to get on the brakes almost, and look, at down the inside, no chance for Peter Dunbrecht, but again, he needs to be very careful, he's got pressure from behind from Stefano Telly, he goes one way, then back across to the left-hand side of the track to make the cutback. David Rigo also sitting watching this. Not able to do an awful lot of fighter, but happy to pick up the pieces, but gets messy. Runs very, very wide on the exit through Aintree onto uh, Wellington Street. And you're on board now with Bass Linders. Down they come towards Brooklyn's Rigo watching what's going on ahead of him. Bass Linders closing up a little bit under braking. Ferrari attacks Audi. Again, Linders riding the curbs there. So uh, uh, Telly taking a lot of the inside of Nuffield. Try and shorten the track fractionally as. Adonis continues on his way in the gap up to actually just under a second. So Adonis managed to pull out the best part of half a second over Darren Turner on that last lap. It was all concertina slightly because of the, the BMW that they were lapping, but the Nissan pulling clear again. If you want an endorsement of how good that Nissan PlayStation Academy competition is, Lucas Adonis is a good example, isn't he? He was the first winner, and here he is keeping Darren Turner at bay. I know that he's now done quite a lot of racing, and he's a very, very good driver, but there is more evidence of it. Yeah, but Darren Turner has his breakfast, his lunch, and his dinner at Silver. He's <laughs> yes. grown up here. But look, look, close, Baz Linder's getting closer to David Rigo, coming onto the string. Can he get under the rear wing of the Ferrari as they come down into Stu? And Dumbrack also is closing on me. Here comes Rigo to have a go at Ortelli. Ferrari challenging Audi, doesn't work. But the danger, of course, is that you have a go and lose a little bit of time and you leave the door open and then you're easy prey for the man behind you. And a look at a defensive, how defensive Otelli had to go, Rigo was a point of time down the inside. The guy who's going to win out of this if he's patient enough will be Baz Linder, yes. because there's going to be frustration eventually from Rigo and, and Otelli. Let's go look and see, up into Cops. That's 15, which is the Carrie Mojé boots and Gini on car. And around it goes. Not a nice place to spin at the speed they're doing. Probably about 110 miles an hour that spin began. But he gets it going in the right direction, and uh, he must say, thank goodness. Or words to that effect, yes. Something like that, yeah. So no damage done. That was the car that John Hartsall crashed this morning. Carrie Mojé recovering after the spin. This is the race leader. We're currently on lap number nine. Lucas Ordonia for leads. Darren Turner getting a bit delayed in traffic, so he's lost to seemingly a touch of ground on this lap. And the Bob Neville run in this amp coming up through Luffield, uh, accelerating now towards the start and finish line. So Lucas Ordonev up front, ahead of Darren Turner. And where's the traffic jam for third? Because it was being headed, of course, by Scriabin in the SMG Ferrari, leader through them. And Darren Turner in second place. And, of course, these two gaining a huge amount of ground over everybody else because, just look, 
We're still waiting. Now third comes through. That's Kriabin. Behind him is Christopher Meese. Then it's Dunbrack in the Nissan in fifth place. There, sixth all tally. Seventh Regan. Eighth Bass Leiders. In ninth place is Ryle Fry. The Swiss girl is closing up a little bit. And Steve Jans in the Mercedes still hanging on in there in the top ten. Mercedes, not necessarily the quickest car in qualifying, but a very good bet for a finish a high position. Three abreast coming into Colts. Very difficult to make it stick. Oh, round the outside goes Colombo. That McLaren's being lapped, don't forget. And it's not exactly getting in the way, but it's not getting out of the way either. The poor driver almost terrified into submission there. Difficult part of the racetrack to go three abreast on the entry into Cops because you get to the outside of the corner, and there will be rubber on the outside, lose grip, and uh, well, dive down the inside there at the end of the stone corner. That's a change of position. That's big lap, Boris big Rosenberg lap. in 72, similar car, yeah. same team, but that's the slow one. Yeah. But Boris Rosenberg is behind the wheel off and he gets out of the way as here comes now Ortelli, Rigon and Bass Linders. And black and white, that, that McLaren we've just seen being lapped at Cox Corner is being driven by Ronan Unessi. He is being shown the driving standards flag because in the first nine laps of the race he's had three spins. I mean, he's had an improvement. It depends whether you agree with him or the race director. I think the race director is less than that. In fairness, I have to say, he's having a hard job. The yeah. car is a difficult car at the present time. And this is a new circuit to him as well. How about this? Three wide up towards Abbey. The Audi is Enzo Ida. Behind him is Henri Moser. And then right up behind them is Michael Amabula. And then you've got the uh, BMW in the hands of Stefano Colombo that's dropped back on this lap. And he's trying to retaliate in the Vita 4 1 car. Absolutely wonderful fight this, and Michael Amamola looking to try to find a way past Moser now. Well, he is a racy race driver, Michael Amamola, I know him well from A1GP days, and uh, his focus is about getting past, and sometimes if he's going to do a bit of rubbing, he will do it. As long as it's within the rules, he's more than content. Stefano Colombo, you're looking at at the back of that group in the Vita 4-1. BMW, he's being warned about not respecting the track limits, and he's now being caught as well by Antoine Leclerc. We've got a McLaren looking to gain places, and that's a very slow Porsche, and it's the 83 Eric Clement car coming out of Club Corner. Uh, that has got no energy at all. I suspect that's a major electronic problem or something that is going to be irreparable. Well, repairable. He's pulling off. Uh, he's got no choice. He can't get back to the pits. He's basically almost at the most distant point from the pits here at Silverstone on the edge of the club. Well, that, in theory, should have been a quick car right through the race because there's Olivier Pla and Nicola Armindo also to have had a stint in that, but it looks as though it's now going to be an early retirement. Now, let's see whether we can piece together what's happened here. This is the, whoops, 34 Porsche oh, hopping over the curb of Eric Demel. Well, just like he couldn't slow the car down, he just literally dived behind the corner, hit the McLaren and uh, sort of snooker ball effect. Yes. No so maybe the problem is... Uh, it looked to me that he didn't, he couldn't slow the car down sufficiently, whether it was because of a, a brake problem. These cars run ABS brakes. Some of them have ha had issues on brakes at different points. Uh, that one we can't tell if it was yeah. a brake problem. He could have got back to the pits. Clearly there was something that was the cause of that, what would have been a poor driving standard. Yes, I'll tell you a lie. It was the other Pro GT car, I call it the... Uh, 34, it was 33, Christian Blugion making that mistake, so a gentleman racer getting it wrong in that part of the circuit. McLaren gaining ground now, and all of this is largely because 72 is getting in the way. Boris Rodenberg has done Stefano Colombo no favours. That Ferrari should have got out of the way, and instead Antoine Leclerc has gained a place because Colombo got boxed in behind him. I mean, that's what you do, you just got to be patient. The opportunities will arise, you've got to be ready to take them when they do arise, and that's what Antoine Leclerc did. He sat there, saw the situation, and he said, thank you very much, easy to make a pass like this. This is Henri Moser, who is trying to get past Enzo Eder, and behind him is Michael Amabula. So you've got the BMW sandwich between the two Audis as the leader flashing his lights comes into Cops Corner with Darren Turner a second behind him. There is Henry Hassid, who is in 51st place after his puncture early on. But he's keeping pace yeah. with the lead two cars. So the bad BMW, disappointingly had a puncture, but he's running at the pace of the lead cars. All he needs now will be a safety car situation. And assuming that they allow him to on lap himself, but a little bit of aggression coming down into top corner of the Mercedes gets through. Steve Yance going ninth at the expense of Ralph Fry. That was a good move. It was, and Ralph Fry was not terribly keen to let him through, but uh, she uh, saw the better of it, and uh, the Mercedes got the position. And once you're on the inside and side by side, then you have to concede. So Steve Yance straight away starts to pull clear. Now remember this great fight for third. Well, here it is, still. Just grab him. 
keeping at bay. Number 13, Christopher Meese, former FIA GT3 European champion. And he goes through Stowe, being chased by Peter Dumbrecht, being chased by Stefan Ortelli, being chased by Davide Regal. And Bas Linus is at the back of that group. There's been no change within it in the last few laps, but they are still as one. And fair play to Scriabin, who is the least experienced of all of this group. He's got some of the best GT racers breathing down his neck. He has not put a wheel out of line. No, and... I think it is to his credit that he's taking all this pressure. Let's look again and see. Oh, that's just how that, that is then plain and simple, just bad driving. That's the Christian Blue Jean yeah. at the moment coming into the end of Vale. To contrast that of Alexander Screven, who's doing a very good job in third place. He has the advantage of having clear air ahead of him. He's not having to worry about battling with other cars that might interfere with his car, but he has, of course, got all the pressure from behind from five other you know, more competitively driven cars than, than maybe his own car is. Another gag on turning his way out of Stoke Corner. Lappery, of course, becoming ever more of a factor now as the race wears on. Back of this little gaggle, you see the Hexes racing. McLaren looking for a way past 34 Porsche, which is the car of Eric Demont. And he's going to nip through on the inside. That's Alexander Sims, who started the lap in 28th place. Well, he certainly was very cautious coming through Vale, and rightly so, because he couldn't predict what the Porsche might do. And uh, with a car that may not be anywhere near perfect for Alexander, he uh, he just used intelligence. Oh, a run Hayek, wide. I think that was going off, wasn't it? Yeah, it the is, there he is. All of that run off tarmac at Abbey. He can stay on that escape road, as it were, and rejoin on the approach towards Village. And Mark Hayek doesn't have to go that slowly, in fairness. He can keep going at a reasonable pace and then just feed back in. That may be a problem. I need to look and see if there's something with the left front. Uh, it's hard to tell in the picture whether there is a a tyre issue, maybe he picked up some debris around the racetrack, something forced him wide at the edge of the abbey and uh, he didn't seem to be terribly keen to get back onto the racetrack particularly quickly. So that car, class winner in this race last year, the equivalent race, started the lap 30th, Mark Hayek losing places then as a consequence. It's still Lucas Ordonian leading the way from Darren Turner, now has Michael Amabula getting on, he's got himself up past Henri Moser now, and there is number 16. Enzo Eden, who's also dropped back, therefore, so we've had the real shuffle between them. And now, as they come on to Hangar Straight, at the head of this little group is Steve Yans. Well, he was looking for a place in the top ten early on. He's now fallen back into 12th spot. Ammermuller is behind him. And there is the Santa Lock Audi turning his way through Stowe. And Henri Moser is staying on the back of the Audi and going with him. Yeah, I mean, Michael Ammermuller and Moser are going to push forward, having gotten through the traffic they were struggling with for what were the, well, was basically the opening for 24 and three-quarter minutes. The second, then, of the Mark VDS Racing BMW is Henri Moser, who, to be fair to him, uh, did a very, very good job last season and in the Monza race as well. Saw him for a time in the FIA GT1 World Championship, Nissan Mountain, former GT3 European champion, and he's going very strongly. As Rob Barth is up to his old tricks of carving his way through the traffic, 44th after a puncture, yeah. and, as ever, he's just going flat out. Well, Rob, Rob is one of those racing drivers who probably is under the radar all the time. Yeah. Very, very capable, very professional, both in and out of the car, does a good job Ooh. for Von Ryan Racing, and uh, he is just trying to make up ground as soon as possible. How about this battle going on? You've got Oliver Morley ahead of Godfrey Jones, the two Mercedes, and then behind them is Harold Primat, delayed after his earlier spin in the Audi, and he's looking for a pass traffic, and Godfrey Jones goes off. And he had a lock-off, that was the reason why yeah. he went off. Just over around the corner, too hard on the brakes, and uh, loses two places in the process. The redoubtable Jones twins, and they've got Morgan, David Sun, uh, joining them this weekend as well, up towards the loop. So Harold Primat was the beneficiary out of that, the ex-single-seater racer turned prototype, now turned GT racer, gaining one spot away from the Pressy Spark Mercedes. A lot has happened in the first 13 laps of this race, but Lucas Ordonieff is still there, resolutely at the head of the field, but the gap has come down, it's point four now between Ordonieff and Turner. Of course, increasingly, traffic has a say in that. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you're getting the seesaw effect of where you happen to catch a car that you're going to lap, uh, and be it, here we see the lead, this end, and the Aston Martin, and second, Ordonieff and Darren Turner, and uh, in the gap, you can see it's, it becomes a point four two five of a second as they go across the start-finish line on the Grand Prix grid, it's probably not a lot different. Somebody off there, one of the Gulf Racing McLarens, bouncing back onto the circuit, right ahead of the leaders who go either side of it, then side by side as well. Turner on the outside, is he going to work? Not there, but the inside up towards the loop, go on Darren, he's going to do it, isn't he, on the inside line? Yes, Aston Martin goes through, great driving by Darren Turner, and that was all that experience put to use. That's, that's the difference between being a race driver and being a virtual race driver. You can't buy the experience. 
Well, John Yeath does a great job for the limited amount of racing experience he has, but Darren Turner has got, not decades, but certainly many years of a racer, single-seaters, GT, prototypes, and he saw that situation, read it absolutely perfectly, yeah. put the Aston Martin into position, blocked out the apex of loop, got ahead of the Nissan, and now he's got to deal with traffic as well, so he's now in the position that Adonyuth was, but half a lap ago. So he leads, and he leads by four tenths of a second. Just doing some quick sums. I reckon Darren's in his third decade of racing. He started in the mid to late 90s, didn't he? But he's got all of this experience, as you say. And Lucas Ordonyev is staying with him. What will be fascinating now is to see whether Ordonyev can fight back and retake that race lead. We're on lap number 15. We've got a new race leader. It's Darren Turner. And that was stirring stuff coming up towards Village. Backmarker made a mistake. They went either side. And Darren just stood his ground because he knew which way the circuit would go to open up that line for him. Yeah, I mean, you cannot buy that experience. You can't stop. Just to get a glimpse of it. And, uh, oh, uh, there's the McLaren. That's what we caught a glimpse of just coming out of Abbey. It was the Porsche, of course, that had stopped earlier in the background. And there we see the battle for the lead. The two cars split the, the McLaren. But Darren goes the long way around Village and gets himself into position to take the, the lead of the race into loop or the loop. And uh, once he's done so, then uh, he's got the advantage. Now he's got clear air in relative terms. They are catching and overtaking the slower cars, but it's not the same as being stacked up in a group of cars, which is going on third, fourth, fifth and sixth positions. He's also got a small advantage still to come, hasn't he? Because they're going to put next into that car. Fred Makaviki is Harold Primat's off the road for the second time in the race, and that's coming out of Brooklyn's by the look of it. Go back to my Aston Martin point. Fred Makaviki will go next, whereas in 35 it's going to be Peter Pazira, who is nowhere near as experienced, and that in real terms should widen the gap between the Aston over the Nissan. Uh, I mean, the, the Aston Martin, the driver lineup in the Aston Martin is undoubtedly, in my view, the strongest of any team out there. I mean, it is. Three guys who are so familiar with that car, they're going to be driving an Aston Martin in two weeks' time at Le Mans, whether it's... This is Baz Linders. Baz, what, what are you doing? doing? Fires it up, he's had a spin. Two cars, that's what's happened, there's been a collision with the Audi. Yeah. He's in the gravel, isn't it? Coming yes. out of far, you can see the tyre marks on the road, look at the witness marks, and yes. is that the Audi of Michael Amamuller, well, maybe? I, I wonder if it is the Amamuller. Certainly, there's been a collision as they've come out of Abbey and uh, made their way through what would be farm curve. The BMW is not going to be able to get out there unassisted. Well, he's, he's got two. Let's look and see what's going on. What's the, what's the Audi doing way, way offline on the outside of Abbey? Strange. That's a bat marker, isn't it? That may well be I a bat marker. But then it gets... comes out, comes across, sideswipes the BMW, forces it off the racetrack, also spins the Audi. We thought that might have been Michael Amamuller, and apologies to Michael, it wasn't. I think it was 41, potentially, which is the similar Santa Lot car of Pierre Hershey. It is. Pierre Hershey, one of the gentleman trophy racers. And now where is he? Uh, well, he's doing a three-point turn well off the racetrack, thank goodness. So uh, he made his way up to the loop. But in fact, there's a link route in the loop, which brings you back out into Chapel Curve, yeah. as you would go on to Hangar Straight. So he's actually more than likely parking the car there. And uh, he'll have difficulty getting back to the pits. So if he should so choose to walk back, he may want to stay there for the rest of the afternoon. There is Lucas Ordonyev in traffic, trying to work his way past the 58 Porsche of Christian Kelders, double class winner last year. Up through Abbey goes the Nissan, the lead gap a second and a half. Now, even though there's traffic, of course, Darren Turner, going back to John Watson's point about being a race driver, not a virtual race driver, he has got more experience of getting through the traffic, and yet again, 77 Rodan Unessi has had a spin, that's at least number four spin, and he's in the middle of the road at Stowe, and that is not a good place to park. He's away again now, but that is just an awful stint. I'm not saying it's all down to Rodan Unessi, but clearly it is not enjoyable for him for whatever reason. He's having a torrid time. It's a messy afternoon. He's got a difficult car in experience. A lot of pressure going on around. He's having to keep an eye on his mirrors. He's having to keep an eye on where he is on the racetrack. And uh, it's not something he's going to take away with great fondness. No, very true. More battles raging on lower down the order, including there the recovering Beach Dean ice cream. Aston Martin, Daniel McKenzie had a gearbox compressor problem. They've changed the gearbox and got him back out again, so that's a good effort to keep the car in the race. I'm afraid it is seven laps down in last place, 57th, but it's still going and it will pick up places over three hours. What's, what's a gearbox compressor? That is what I am told. Interesting. I think that's something that requires further investigation.
Jack is the man in the pit lane. Jack we shall send him in that lane. direction. Be, give us an explanation at some point. This is Unessi. Oh, he got oh, tangled up with yeah, Mark he, Hayek. he just was overwhelmed. Cars everywhere into the valley of Stu Corner. <laughs> to Rodin Unessi facing the wrong way, but to be fair to him, that wasn't entirely his fault, and that's another drama for Phil Dryberg's Aston Martin. He nearly, nearly clipped the back of the Ferrari as he felt himself going in the right direction. Almost every camera shot is somebody having a drama at the moment, isn't it? There's so much happening. Well, we're some 33 minutes into the race, just over half distance for the stint of any of these drivers. For many of them, this is unknown territory they've not run this long on a single set of tires on this racetrack in these temperatures in these conditions so it's almost like stick your finger in the air lick it and see where the direction is coming from it is quite tough indeed it's okay for the professional drivers they know their way around the pro cup drivers and do this day in day out literally but for the gentleman trophy drivers different era now bass linder's car i think is still been part has it? No, it's out of the gravel bed, so it's circulating hopefully once more, but it's going to have lost quite a lot of time. It is now two laps down, so any chance of a good result has gone. There it is, yes, recovering, having got out of the gravel, but it's not just the fact it's been off the road, it's also got damage, and Bass Liners is in limp home mode. Yeah, he's, certainly the left front of the car is damaged. It may again just be something damage to that left front tyre, but coming back ever, ever so cautiously. That steering wheel's well, that actually, line, is it? it looks like it might be more than maybe a tyre. Broken the, suspension, well, I suggest. Well, damaged the suspension, certainly the left side of the car is the problem. It's very and low, the, isn't it? Ba very low at the rear as well. Baz Landers coming back, not wanting to inflict any further damage to this car than he might have, ordered, but it might have occurred in the collision. Suspension and or puncture, yep. so Baz Landers limped it home, but oh dear, oh dear. You also now see how slow he's going. Look at everybody else just whistling past him up on the inside, and Baz doing the job properly, keeping out of everybody's way here. But all he wants to do is get it back to the pits as quickly as possible, but he doesn't want to risk doing any further damage, so very, very frustrating. What else have we had going on? Steve Yance is there in the Mercedes, this is Luffield, and he just gets it wrong. Loses the back of the car. It, 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 Whoops, that's Eugene Ramos me, arriving. Oh. It, it is, it is busy. <laughs> but it just, that was a very all too simple turned in on the brakes turn the wheel off the throttle back end is light it's unloaded and once you get the pendulum effect that's what you saw and the car had a harmless spin but it could have been much more serious because as he made his way back in the direction of travel two cars went one above and one, one went below the beach dean ice cream aston i'll finish this one off um, gearbox compression failure I, I, I'm John, still, John, John is still pondering. I, I can understand a gearbox problem, but I, I mean, an engine's got a compression ratio, but I'm not sure what a gearbox compression problem is, other than the oil is getting too hot or there's a lack of oil pressure in the gearbox. Maybe the way it's expressed is I'm not getting the message. Next little fight, Antoine Leclerc looking for a way past Enzo Eid coming down towards Stowe, and behind them is Stephen Jelly in the Fortec Mercedes. Yep, Fortec first event in Blancpain this season. Yeah. They had actually tried to get Ricardo Rosset into this car, but time was too short to get everything organised. But uh, another driver from the Richard Dutton stable of Mill. That's the replay yeah, of Bass Line is being yeah. Hershey. Yeah, Hershey giving him a whack. It was a good whack. And that left rear corner did take a major thump. Yes. Yes, I fear that BMW may soon become a retirement, but we'll find out. Michael Amabuller is in the pits as well, so he had a slow lap and he's now in the pit lane, so just as Michael Amabuller draws attention to himself by being busy in a battle, he's got a problem as well and he's tumbling down the order as well. And Bass Liner's left rear puncture, at least, on the number three BMW. Gap now up to just under three seconds of the space of what, five, six laps since Darren Turner took the lead of this race. He's just gently, gently eased away, principally using the traffic that is now literally all around this racetrack. If you imagine Le Mans, this is the number of cars you'd have a, a, a racetrack more than double the length of Silverstone. And uh, it is busy. Very, very difficult for drivers to ensure that they're in the right part of the racetrack, particularly the lead drivers when they come up to the back markers to ensure that they get through cleanly and they don't compromise themselves. And, I saw that happen to Baz Landers when a car was struggling offline and coming back on track, innocently got slammed at the side 
And uh, it may be the end of Baz's race, or certainly it'll take time to get the car back up. Well, there he is. He's, he's back, back on track. Well, he's must... 54th, three laps down. And if he's got away with only a puncture, he's pretty lucky, actually. He is. I mean, there's no doubt that he took a good whack. I mean, the Audi came in, sort of whack. If it was wheel to wheel, he may just have gotten away with the puncture, but you always want to have a good look around. The rear suspension, all the links that keep the wheels pointing in the correct direction, and that uh, there's nothing that is either bent or shows any signs of uh, being damaged. In traffic there is Lucas Ordonez trying to wriggle his way past Daniel McKenzie. Uh, let me just go back for a moment, John, on track limits. The race director has communicated to us that if you offend twice, then you are put on the timing screen by way of a warning. A third offence, you get the driving standards flag. Anything after offence number three could be a drive-through penalty. Then you're assuming the driver will receive the message from the pit lane via radio or via the pit board, and if the pit board's hung out, he may not even see it. So, so much concentration is required do what the driver is doing that very often they don't get the message. But the first drive-through is about to be given because Antoine Leclerc is being given a drive-through penalty for not respecting the track limits. The ART Grand Prix McLaren which has had the warnings on the timing screen and he now cops the first drive-through of the well, race. Well, you know, Antoine often acts as a journalist, a TV reporter. It'll be interesting to hear him interviewing himself as to why he abused the track limits. I'd love to hear his comment on that one. And Michael Amabola is out of the race, gearbox failure in the Audi. Oh, it's hard. I don't know how you have a gearbox failure in a modern race car. You've got hand controls, there's no requirement for the driver to synchronise the gear changes, other than you're just animal when you're making... Oh, wheels come off! And it's George, a safety George's friends. barrier, so let's have a look and see who that is. Somewhere there is a three-wheeler. Oh, dear me, come in. Oh, that's oh, great. Strange coming out of entry. It's a McLaren as well. It's an ART Grand Prix McLaren. It's 12, which means that it is Gregoire de Moustier. What, 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 what has he done to deserve that? <laughs> Just party company completely. He's been off, though, hasn't he? Look, because he's got a load of grass in the radiator at the front. So well, that, that might have been the consequence of the wheel coming yeah. off, because the right hand wheels come off. He would have obviously, if it was in the corner, gone off. Is Here that go. the wheel about to come off? Yes, it is. And that's so, going to throw him onto the grass. There it is. But he, he, he went off track once the wheel had come off driving, and he didn't realize, well, maybe he didn't realize the wheel had come off, but uh, he would have certainly found it difficult to, to control the car going through the left hand entry corner. Indeed so. So Gregoire de Moustier comes into the pit, and his teammate's got to come in for a drive through. So ART Grand Prix finds itself in a whole world of pain at the moment. Neither car going quite as they would have liked. Drive through penalty, at least you can come back from, but number 12. The good thing, in a sense, for him was that it at least happened quite close to the end of the lap. This is Ahmad al at the wheel of the ARC Bratislava Porsche, the Oman driver, sharing with Slovakia and Nero Konotka, and he's coming down through Vale. And Ahmad al racing in British GT this year as well as Block Pan, and he's working his way through the traffic now. Currently, he's in 22nd place. Yeah, and just gets the power on a little bit of the back end, stepping out of the Porsche, but uh, maintaining a position, picking up slightly as he comes down into Abbey, not quite flat out at this stage in the race with the tyre beginning to wear and degradation coming from the tyre. We ride on board with the Porsche, comes into far corner, very wide and open and lots of opportunities and choices for drivers, that's made deliberately so to encourage a driver to take a dive down the outside and make the switch back or a dive up on the inside, try to defend, then through the flat out entry corner very short corner in terms of in and out, but very fun to drive because it's quick. It's been a down break. We've got another drive through, John. It's being given to Stefano Colombo in the Vita 4 1 BMW, and I suspect there will be more to come as well. Daniel McKenzie looking at the Beach Dean Aston Martin. He's got the pace now, look, working his way past other Ferraris. That is the soft rev car of Jean Luc Blanchemont, which slots in ahead of the Royal BMW, which was started by Michele Ceruti, and that's running now in 38th place. But of course, these cars are on different laps. Whoops! Ceruti puts a wheel onto the dirt and almost loses it ahead of Christopher Meese. Fourth and fifth there going through, sorry, third and fourth now going through, but in traffic, and that traffic nearly getting in the way. Meese third, Dumbreck fourth, fifth is Ortelli, down to sixth has gone Scriabin. So out of shot, finally, they've found a way past the Ferrari, and that's released all this lot. And now look at the way that Christopher Meese is charging. Yeah, no doubt that was due to a lap of slower cars and just simply getting unexperienced by the drivers behind. And, uh, really when these circumstances arise five six cars coming in a group all racing 
much more competitively than you. You just do your best to keep an eye on the mirror, but not put yourself in such a position that you become a hazard in itself. So he can now breathe and relax. Those cars, four of them, you can see directly ahead, have gotten through. And uh, then he's got another three coming up behind. Now towards Brooklands then. This is the fight for third and fourth. Christopher Meese ahead of Peter Dambrek. That Nissan, well placed, still a potential winning car. Fourth at the moment, Dambrek, but again, a good combination of drivers. Don't forget that there is uh, Lucas Law and Stephen Kane to get into that car. Stephen Kane made his rally debut a week ago. Yes, it'll work spinning, I guess, yes. WRC yes. Mini. In somewhere in the Sperron Hills and County Tyrone. Something like that. I got that little scoop on the as I came out. I don't know why. Somebody told me, <laughs> Stephen Kane, why do you want to be a rally driver? I know that in Ireland, rallying is mega, yes. especially with WRC cars. Anyway, nothing familiar about a WRC Mini and uh, a Nissan. Uh, Very different combination yeah. of cars. This battle you're looking Close. at is for eight. Ralph Fry ahead of Eugenio Amos. So it's Audi ahead of Ferrari. Amos in the car that's stepped up from Pro-Am to Pro-Cup for this year. It's the one that Castellacci and Petrobelli share with him. It had the brake issue at Monza, but it's going strongly now. Eugenio Amos doing the first stint here, and he's tucked right up onto the tail of the Audi. And then behind is another of the uh, SMP racing Ferraris, Victor Scheitar, one of the many Russian drivers we've got in the championship this year. On to Hanker Straight they come, and look who is behind them. It's the charging VDS BMW. And we've got five different team managers being summoned to the race director immediately. The offence for this I've not told us yet, but I think we could be getting a whole raft of penalties. Baz Landers dropped all the way down to 53rd position. So that's going to be a long afternoon's work for Baz. Well, he'll be out of the car fairly shortly. But nevertheless, tough day for Yelmar Gorman and then ultimately Maxime Martin, who will drive the wheels off that car. But 53rd, well... Can't see it happening in the remaining two hours and 14 minutes. These drive-through penalties that we're getting are for uh, more than four track limit offences. So there's a totting up system going on in race control. So, yeah, the observers in the race control must be working absolutely <laughs> overtime because <laughs> so much of it does occur in the exit of Club Corner, some of it occurs in the exit of Cobb's Corner. Those are the two corners where it is easy. Even here you can see running wide. I mean. If you got all four wheels over that red and white line, then you would be exceeding circuit limits. Even coming out of Luffield, the exit of Luffield, it's easy to overrun. So slight, slight error from the Ferrari and offering up an opportunity. The Audi didn't quite get position, but it's certainly challenging strong. Fry ahead of Amos in the black Ferrari, just ahead of Scheiter in the purple and white and red Ferrari as they come across the timing line now. So these three, 8th, 9th and 10th, running together and in back markers. And look at this, Good Eugenio pass. Amos trying to go up the inside. Good job. The back marker gets out of the way, Felipe Barreros in the uh, AF Corsa Ferrari. And let us hear from Gregoire de Moustier, who lost that wheel in the McLaren because he is in the pit lane. And we can hear for the first time from Jack Nichols. Gregoire, uh, we can see the team working hard behind us on the on the car. What what happened? I don't know exactly what happened. Uh, I had a small contact with the Porsche on the whole beginning of the race, uh, and then I lost uh, I lost a wheel. So I don't know yet. We'll see. Do you think you'll be able to get out again? Is that it? Must have been a scary moment for you. Yes, I think we will be able to to go out again. But uh, for for playing for a podium, uh, it's finished. So. We'll try to have fun and to, to be as quick as possible. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, there's the replay of the wheel party company. But that was kind of the second part of the story. The first bit, the contact, we didn't see. We didn't see that. And uh, Greg Ross, not, I mean, he's not going out, I would imagine. By the time the car is repaired, they will uh, replace him with the second driver. Uh, but again, you can see just the work around the front of the McLaren. Not a huge amount of energy, maybe even enthusiasm to get that car repaired and get back out. And Gregoire is sort of seemingly not entirely clear as to what did happen and what might have gone on, so... Aye, aye. One of those days. One of those days. Move on, next round. Uh, Jan Goody or Gilles Vanaday to replace him for the second stint in that car. And we are not even yet at the end of the first hour, and a heck of a lot has happened. But Darren Turner is the leader by only 4.8 seconds. He's not gone storming off into the distance, although traffic's gone against that to a degree. No, I think that uh, Lucas Adonias has done a very good job, in fact, to keep the gap under five seconds. Yeah. Bearing in mind that the experience Darren has, not so much in lap time per se, but 
it's the, it's the use of traffic and being able to put yourself in the right position at the right time and at the same time you try to make that move to affect Adonis so that he catches the car in the wrong part of the racetrack. That's all a part of the skill of an experienced and thinking race driver. Adonis doing a good job. Absolutely right. And we know that car's going to be quick in the last hour as well once Alex Buncombe gets on board. If you can stop round about the hour mark, then that's fine. That's what you want to do for the fuel load and divvy it up into three one-hour stints, really. Two mandatory stops as you're looking at the fight for third place. And Christopher Meese is ahead of that 71 going all off the road. Victor Scheidler, who almost gets collected Dear by me. Henri Moser behind him. I mean, it looked like he never even got off from front. I know the grass is uh, pretty slippery, although there has been no rain here for a few days. Nevertheless, the sap in the grass does not like rubber, and uh, Ferrari did not really up in Beckett's at all occurred, and the left-hand part of Beckett's got it all completely wrong, then cut across the inside of the final part of Beckett's, and I tried to think what thoughts were going through the mind as uh, we saw Gray was about to re-enter the racetrack just ahead of the BMW. That is incredibly close. Too close to call. <laughs> Absolutely. Henri Moser then survives, but he'll gain 10th place out of that. That's the good news. Might have brought tears to his eyes as well as uh, we all got a bit too close for comfort, as you say. Dumb wreck then in the Nissan. Still chasing after Christopher Meese. And 2010 to go, John. Just watching that little issue, one of the most important aspects of a racing driver is his ability to smell. Because while the BMW could see all that was going on there, the next car is up. But as soon as they got within maybe 50 metres or 100 metres of where the incident occurred, they ought to be able to smell the smell of freshly mown grass. And that will tell you somebody's been off track. There may be debris in the racetrack. There may be something on the track that could be a problem for you. So be alert. Use your senses, not just simply your eyes, your hands and your feet. Back into the camera that comes already in Unessi. We've seen him spinning a lot now. 77 is in the pit lane. And... That car. So this is all a stop, 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 stop. Because this is the stop, go stuff. There's only drive-through so drive far. Okay. Ah, that list of team managers that recently appeared is drive-through penalties for overtaking under yellow flags. Now, one of them is Rob Barth, who should know better, I'm afraid to say. Uh, one is Alexander Skriabin, who was in that leading group. One is Henri Moser. Another one, 22, is Godfrey Jones. Should and better? Yes, true. And 43 is the other one, which you can't find. There is Rob Barth, back on track. Oh, 43 is Michele Cerruti's BMW, right, so that sorts out the cars for overtaking up the yellows, and Oliver Morley in the Mercedes has copped one for not respecting the track limits. Right, so Rob Barth, um, <clears throat> yes, overtaking up the yellows. You know, he's such an innocent-looking guy. Yes. Uh, there's an example of running more than four wheels on the exit, and uh, that's in the pursuit of the car that's about to be left. Where is Rob at the moment? He turns I think he's about to be again. Got another... It's Christopher Meeks and Peter yeah, Dunbrand behind him. Yeah, but it's Rob is the one that really is being told, get out of the way, yeah. you're not in this race, you're holding all, uh, holding all of us up. So it runs slightly wider in the exit of the loop, but uh, not conceding. 32nd he is in the order, and of course that car can run at the pace of the leaders in a sense, he now does get out of the way. Whoa, 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 a little bit of temper there as the Audi sort of swayed across the front of the McLaren to say, I'm not impressed. Could have done that much earlier. And Christopher Mee still under attack for his third place. Peter Dumbrecht challenges on the outside, up towards Lafield, right up behind them is Stefan Ortelli as well. So three top drivers here, running as one, coming out of the corner. Davide Rigon, intriguingly, has been dropped quite a long yeah. way back, hasn't he, now, in the Castle Racing Ferrari next up, because having been with them early on, that car now pretty much on its own. Maybe he's just got a minor problem we don't know about, but certainly the two Audis and the Nissan and the Sandwich are going at it, Hammer and Tongs. David, or not David, Peter Dumbrecht clearly would love to be ahead, but uh, the two ideas are keeping that Nissan well controlled. We've got two hours and seven minutes to go of round two of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series here at Silverstone, and battles rage on right the way across the circuit there. Fifth is number one, Stefan Ortelli, making his way now onto the hangar straight, down towards Stowe Corner they come. Ahead is Peter Dumbrack, and in fact, this time Peter is just dropping away slightly from Christopher Meese, and he's conscious he's going to have to defend from Stefan Ortelli. And I can tell you, Stefan Ortelli was probably right up against the steering wheel, pushing the foot, the throttle through the bulkhead on that Audi, trying to squeeze horsepower. He can't get any more out of it because he saw that the Nissan was not quite so quick as it had been previously. On to Hangar Straight, 
Now he's got to be careful not to overrun the car and lose his own momentum. He's dropped back again slightly. Peter Dombrek has regained composure. Again, Otelli running very wide in the exit of club. Needs to be careful. He doesn't find himself being given a drive through for lack of respect to the circuit. And further up the road for these guys is a lot more traffic as well. They've got to work their way through the slower cars. Look there, you can see Christopher Meese disposing of Porsche. He's got Ferrari and Aston Martin ahead. And as he's working his way through the traffic, he wants to make sure that Peter Dumbrecht isn't given a sniff of gaining the place. And Ortelli has to go the long way round the back markers there. He gets away with that, doesn't really lose too much by it. And Stefan Ortelli trying to stay with Dumbrecht, who again has to dodge around back markers. Yeah, but Christopher Meese really. He came through all that pretty cleanly. Peter Dumbrecht had to work at it a little bit harder, and uh, Telly behind, maybe just relaxing for a moment or two to try and see what is going to happen. These two cars, teammate and the idea, Peter Dumbrecht and the descent. Pouring through Cops Corner, there is Peter Dumbrecht's car, and looking at the rest of the field all filing through, there's the earlier delayed Henry Hassid BMW that's working its way back up the order after that punctured tyre that cost it ground early on in the race, went strongly in class at Monza. So Dumbrack third, out of, sorry, fourth, I should say, out of Cops Corner. Now what is he doing relative to Christopher Meese? Half a second is the gap between them. Carving their way through traffic, Christopher Meese doing a good solid stint. And now look, you see Dumbrack gets held up by traffic and Ortelli is right on his tail. They're going to be three wide through the Beckett's S's if possible. It's not going to work there, so Dumbrack being held up by the number 16 Audi of Enzo Eid. On to Hangar Straight they come now. Can the Nissan pounce or is Stefan Ortelli going to be able to find a way past? Dumbrecht flashing his light saying, come on, I'm quicker, get out of the way. Well, he's going to make a effort. Surely he's going to have a look down the inside. Force of the way through. Squeeze Enzo Ede to the outside of the corner. Force him to back off. Now you're in a position. You've gained the advantage, the upper hand. You then use the ID to slow down the pace of Stefan Ortelli. Make him back up against Enzo Ede. And Enzo will then have to look for a way to allow Stefan Otelli, who is quicker than oh, the Ferrari on the right, a left rear tyre. And that is a deflation that is now three quarters off the rim, a slow trip back again, long way from the pit, 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 pit lane entrance. Alexander Frolov out of the Pro-Am Cup, not one of the leading cars, but even so, that's a problem he could well do without. And fair play, he's keeping well off the circuit, out of everybody's way, but then he's going to find grass, and he's going to have to get back onto the tarmac so he doesn't drive all over the grass. And, make things even worse. He's got the best part of a mile or more yeah. to get back to the pit lane entrance with a car with a flailing tyre. Uh, although these tyres no longer flail in the way the old cross-ply tyres of yore would have done, but nonetheless, you've got to be very careful. You could damage your suspension, you could damage the potentially brake lines and transmissions also. They don't like the difference in diameter between one side, which is a fully inflated tyre, and the other side, which is a fully deflated tyre, doesn't do them much good. So the field currently working lap 28 at Silverstone. That Ferrari of Alexander Frolov in for a long run back towards the pit lane. And Darren Turner is now leading by six and a half seconds. Another driver being warned about the track limits is Harold Primer. We've seen him having two spins already in the race so far. One with a bit of help, admittedly. There's Frolov. Yeah, and Enzo eats still ahead <laughs> of Stefano Telli. And I don't know whether Enzo is aware of that or whether. Ortelli is uh, just unable to find the opportunity, but uh, he'll want to get past Enzo Eid to put that challenge back to Peter Dumbrey. Both in Audis, of course, Eid and Ortelli, but different teams. Into the pit lane comes Christopher Meese. Now, this is the first of the really significant pit stops. It's the first routine stop. It's not quite on the hour mark, is it? Three minutes, really, before the hour. How's that going to affect things on the fuel later on? And Christopher Meese will hand the car over to Edward Sensor or Frank Stippler. Stippler, he thinks it is behind the wheel. And that was 27 laps that car 13 came in at. Interestingly, we have not seen a safety car intervention. Oh. And I think a lot of teams, particularly the teams that are running at the front, potentially winning teams, always are gambling somewhere down the line that there will be a safety car intervention for just simply for fuel reasons of nothing else. We've had drama out on track, but we haven't had enough to merit a safety car period. And, of course, another thing about the modern day of Silverstone with all of that run-off tarmac and all the access lanes around Silverstone is that it's easy to get a snatch vehicle out there without having to be on circuit. It can go around the perimeter roads and get to a marshal's point, get things out of the way. But we did see an incident earlier in the day in the Lamborghini Trofeo race where a Lamborghini had an incident coming down in Wellington Strait. I didn't see the cause of it. And that actually led to the race being red flagged. Yeah. So there are circumstances, even here in the wide-open spaces, where you could have an incident such as we saw earlier in the day. 
Yes, the car was able to be removed. What the problem was, was there was an enormous hole punched in the barrier and eight supports behind the Armco had disappeared as well. So what they had to do was put, and you'll see it on Wellington Strait, two tyre stacks in front of the barrier to prevent anyone else going into that hole in the wall effectively. So, yeah, trackside furniture being damaged as much as cars going off. However, for the moment, we're on lap 29. It is still Aston Martin from Nissan at the head of the field. There is the race leader because going through the Beckett Sessies once again is Darren Turner and he's using the correct line, he's using as much curve as he can the way he wants to try and just shorten the lap ever so slightly and this, Darren's amazingly, first time out in the Block Pan Endurance Series and just as we said at the start of the race, this is still looking as though it's going to be the car to beat right the way through the three hours. Very strong driver combination, very good car, driven by Darren right now, using the traffic, not doing anything rash, reading how he can pass, where to do the passing, and, uh, you know, it's just so easy. Ortelli in, we've also got Dumbrek in, and Davini Rigon is in as well, and that's at the end of lap 28. And that takes you to just about on the hour mark, so anybody now that's staying out, going over an hour, is in the box seat, credits, because, please. yeah, they are going further on a tank of fuel, and that's going to be the key to this. Well, I think the Dumbrek pit stop is about as far as they could go. They've still got a Donia in the second place in Nissan. I expect it's going to be in probably at the end of this lap because I know that the Nissans were all running very marginal on the fuel to the one hour. Ahmad al yep. in the pit lane. He got himself up to 16th place. What a great effort. Good effort indeed. Indeed so with Mira Konopka. And nice to see a Porsche yep. in the top 20. Because there aren't that many of them. We've lost one, as we saw, parking out on track. The car started by Eric Clément. Right, go, 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 number one. Stefan Ortelli has handed the car over now, so it blasts back and goes back out ahead still of the Kessel Racing Ferrari. So Audi keeps track position there. But I think Peter Dumbrecht's still in the pit lane, or that car, so this looks like it's a long stop. Dumbrecht still being shown as being in the pit lane. So 23, for whatever reason, is having a problem in the pits, as far as we can tell, looking at the timing screen more for the pictures to do this. Now it has gone. But I fear that the Nissan has had a very long stop for whatever reason. Well, we did find out the reason for that pit stop because there was nothing clear from Peter Dumbrecht. The car's performance was strong. There was no issue about, uh, as on the Aston Martin, we know that they've got a tyre wheel hub assembly which is not structured to this kind of racing. It's more for a time pit stop. So they lose five or to eight seconds per pit stop over the opposition. Hotel, yes, indeed, Odonia is in. And this is the Mira Konopka uh, Porsche, and that has parked behind one of the Black Falcon Mercedes. That's Oliver Morley's car that's come in, and it is very, very, very busy in the pit lane. Ralph Fry is now in, also Victor Shaita is in, and the pit lane where you've got cars like this from different teams parked nose to tail becomes a real, real problem. One or two teams, like AF Corsa, their look, that's the garage you can see nearest to you, um, are near a big break in the pit garages, so they can spread themselves down the pit lane a little bit, get a bit more space, and that really is crucial. Oh, it's a huge advantage. We saw in Monza where cars were coming in as cars were trying to get out, and they were just literally boxing one another in, and there was nothing the car that was willing to leave the box to go back on racetrack was able to do, as we see the lead Aston Martin make its way around the store part of the racetrack through Farm Corner up to the loop. Darren Turner... Last lap, two minutes, 03.114. In fact, Adonia's last lap was half a second a lap quicker. Maybe, again, just where the traffic you meet it and uh, just half a second's worth of caution is uh, the right thing to do. Up on the jacks goes number two. Remember, these are two-part pit stops. The fuel and driver change is part one, and then change the tyres is part two, and it's two mechanics only that can do this work. The team manager can be there as well, but it's pretty physical stuff, this. It's very physical, but look, there is a very, very well-oiled yeah. machine in the Belgium ID Cup, and uh, Vincent Pass cracks the whip, and a uh, good job for ID. It's that type of pit work, slick in, out, good driver changes, that's where you win these endurance races. It isn't always because you've got a very quick car. And I think Sir Fenton Foss had an air of confidence that podium was going to be his today. Yes, he did, didn't he? Peter Pizzera having taken over from Lucas Odoniev now back on track. And number two, which was Raoul Fry, that has gone the way of Nicky Mar Malhoff. Still haven't seen race leader in. No. That's a, a long run. I'm going to say he's going to come at the end of this lap because 
we're an hour and what three minutes or so into this race so how much longer can uh, Darren Turner and the Aston Martin stay out on track certainly if he can stay out as long as he can it's going to work to his advantage Bob Ryan Racing's team manager being summoned to race control Rob Barth remember giving that drive through I don't think he's taken it and I fear that Rob might be finding himself in even hotter water now well, you know, next time he goes to Silverstone Driving School to do a bit of instruction, <laughs> I hope he does tell his pupils that he, even I can sometimes do it wrong. Darren Turner slides the ass and really give it lots of welly through Farm Curve. On the brakes into Village, just stays in the middle of the road, then over to the right, then makes the cut back. You don't need to go right to the extreme outside on the approach into the loop. And then the run through eight and corner and then full throttle of the Blair of the V8 Aston Martin engine uh, proving to be very very effective indeed here at Silverstone so on uh, this lap will Darren Turner at the end of lap 31 will he make it finally into the pits or is he going to stay out he's going to be he's going to be cautious of I think he's going to come in Darren are you going to come in no, no. he's enjoying himself he's done a great job he is isn't he and if the fuel is there, keep going. Yellow flag at Cops Corner look on the approach. Now, what have we lost there? Is it a car stopped? Or is it a car that has spun and gone on? Or is it a car irretrievable? Can't see from that shot. Need to pan around the corner. There's, it's not a safety car period, for example. It's, it's an isolated yellow at one corner. Peter Dumbo. Yeah, BMWs. That's up at... Is that not the exit of... Wait for the wide that's, angle that's to get a village, view. isn't it? That's village to the loop. Two oh, cars. That's Stefano just Colombo is one. Yeah, some of the, some of the loop, yeah. That is the Bachelier Blanc Malagol Ferrari that's got tagged up with it. So that's not the yellow flag at Cobbs, that's a no, different no, incident. Different issue altogether. Trying to get to the bottom of that one. So John Marc Bachelier is the man that's had the incident with Stefano Colombo. And he's about to get back onto the circuit now, coming through entry. And Darren Turner is still out there. Halfway and, around the lap. Yeah. Now, um, Brett, might come in this time. I, I think there's a good chance he'll come in this time. <laughs> I mean, if I keep saying it, he will come in. But again, if the, the timing when you come in, as we look at him, the BMW is still stranded. And, uh, just going back to Darren Turner, you know, when you start to catch up a lot of traffic, as he's now doing, is this the right opportunity to bring your driver in? Darren was getting a blue flag waved at these two cars, so they have to concede ground to the lead car. Chose not to do it in the entry into the loop, or into, into, into village corner, I should say. That's for the BMWs. So he couldn't overtake that wave yellow flag. He says you cannot overtake. It's only when you then get a green at the next flag station that it is then clear. And one well, of the McLarens is due to come in, the Gulf team. So which of the two cars will that be? Just quickly to say also that the Alexander Scriab in Ferrari that was going strongly in that first stint, they've done a driver change. They put Alexi Bassoff in the car, but it has got a drive-through to serve for speeding in the pit lane. So, having gone strongly, now that car's race is unravelling as well. Darren Turner comes through Luffield, and John? Darren Turner's coming into the pits! Well spotted, he's done it at last, he's in. So that is going to be 32 laps done by Darren when he breaks the timing beam, and in he comes now. So that is a very, very good first stint. And more importantly, it's an hour and six minutes and 38 seconds into the race, so that's going to give them lots of scope for overlap now this car with wheel nuts that are not designed for what you might call a natural pit stop they're designed for championships where you stop for a specified time they will be a little bit slower so it was important that he stayed up built up that margin because some of it only a little but some of it will be eroded while he's in the pits but Fred Makovicki has jumped in indeed and fearless Fred <laughs> will be out there and he will nail the Aston Martin as he did in qualifying with a great lap of two minutes and one second and uh, such an, you, know, you can never get upset at Fred Mackie Vicky because when you look at him, he just opens a big smile yes, yes. and he blinds you with his teeth and, you know, it's just just Fred Mackie Vicky. But he's an absolute star as well. The British media perhaps latch onto other drivers and Fred Makaviki is very much one of the star drivers. And so the mechanics now do all four corners, they change the tyres and then their last job, as they run around the back, is to light the blue touch paper. And that is going to propel Fred Makaviki into this stint and let us see that he was the quickest man in qualifying on a slightly heavier fuel load than one as well. Let's see what he can do. There is car one, Laurence Van Tour at the wheel. Yeah, but it's actually uh, Stifler in the sister car who is ahead. He's in second place. In fact, technically, he is in the lead because the turner Aston Martin, which was leading at the end of lap 32, is in the pits. It's now going to leave the pit lane. So 
the overlap should see the Aston Martin regain the lead when they complete this lap. McAvicki does go back out in the lead, and uh, Frank Stippler, Laurent on four, second and third in the Belgium Audi Racing Audi Auto Club team cars. So there is the leader. Fred McAvicki now takes over number 97 and look for an Audi in the background. Where, where, where? Just coming up. No, it's not. A long uh, way, Smith. There is, is Stippler. 13, that's the Schlippler car in traffic. Behind 230 as well, which is the Humed Al-Masoud, Charles Bateman, Matt Bell uh, driven Nissan. Charlie Bateman having started it. Oh, look at the weaving oh. coming down the straight. Oh, no. That's the field driver, John Gore Aston, having had a moment. And this problem that uh, to keep the engine running. If there is an anti stall device on these cars, sometimes it kicks in. A little bit of spent fuel in the exhaust system igniting, but it gets back underway. Fastest second sector, third sector time, car 57. Francesco Castellacci in the black Ferrari, the Vita 41 Team Italy car that was started by Eugenio Amos. So that car is starting to get stronger as well. Again, it's just fascinating, isn't it? You put different yes, drivers in absolutely. and the whole thing changes. Castellacci is essentially a single seater race driver, yeah. driving a GT because it's great racing and that's something he loves doing. Now this, in the 35 Nissan, is Peter Pizzera, who is not as quick as Ordonieff nor Alex Bunker, who will do the last stint. So, without wanting to be rude, this is a kind of damage limitation stint. He obviously wants to go as quick as he can, but he doesn't want to lose too much time and make Alex Bunker's workload even bigger. Indeed. I, just, I want to see what Peter Pizzera's first flying lap is going to be. He's coming across the start-finish line, but of course on the, the Grand Prix pits down at wing, and uh, makes his way through Abbey. And, through the, the curve of farm curve on the brakes. You know, it's a big, big challenge. Most drivers come into motorsport through karting and then into junior formulas. Some go through saloons and GT as well to get to this level. But coming through the, the, the academy, the this and the program that they set in place, still going on, is uh, quite remarkable. And then when you do go racing, it is in a very bright spotlight, isn't it? You're not hidden away in club races, you're thrown into it, into a GT Championship. And now, look at this, Fred McAvicki. The aggression. Look how aggressive Fred McAvicki is. Much, much more so than Darren Turner. He knows that he wants to get past the McLaren at the very earliest opportunity. He's right under the rear wing coming through Beckett, flashing the headlights. Lost a little bit of momentum coming onto the straight because he was so close. He then forces the issue and dives up in the inside, gets past. In fact, the Ferrari as well, trying to get alongside it as they come down the veil, succeeds in doing so. And that's Fred McAvicki. He, yeah. he just really is aggressive behind the wheel. But controlled aggression. He's not bouncing off other cars. He's not hurling it over the curbs. That McLaren he was trying to get past was only for 52nd place. He was lapping Yangudi. But even so, he's got to get past because he doesn't want to lose any time at all. Not at all. I mean, what a driver will do in the position of Makivicki is you put a driver, that, a lap driver, under pressure. You put your car right into the mirror of the car that you're trying to get ahead to force the driver to look at the mirror, the side mirrors, to make him get out of the way. The danger is that you make him overreact and then you get involved yourself. But Fred managed to do that cleanly. Now look at Peter Pazira, he's lapping, Peter Pazira's lapping in two minutes, two seconds. He's doing a good job, even though he has died currently in fifth place. Now, John, because this is an interactive commentary, uh, we had that conversation early on about gearbox compression. Yep. It is what actually actuates the shift from the steering wheel paddles, either hydraulic or air compressor. And this comes from uh, GT team owner and touring car team boss, Mike Jordan. And, and who knows better than Mike? There you go. I mean, an expert in the making. <laughs> so, Mike, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Attention. Yes. Delighted. And it's a shame the team couldn't just say that. <laughs> exactly, yes. Well, you have to have somebody that's, you know... A communicator. A communicator to tell us these things. Um, and before you ask where the Joneses are, Mike, um, I need to look on a different page, because after Godfrey locked up earlier on, 26th is where David Jones is. Let's, now that we've had the first round of pit stops, try and catch up with who is where, and let's go through the order. So, 97, Fred McAvicki leads from Frank Stippler, from now Lawrence Vantour, who's taken over from Stefan Ortelli. Fourth is Cesar Ramos in the Kessel Racing Ferrari that won at Monza. And then in fifth place, it should be 35, Peter Pizzera, having taken over from Lucas Ordonia. So that car has lost out a little bit 
on the pit stops, but the one that's really lost out is sixth, where you've got 23, Lucas Law. Still want to get to the bottom of why that was such a pox pit stop, because they've lost chunks of time. Seventh now is number two, Nicky Mar Malhoff. In eighth place, 57, Francesco Castellacci in the Ferrari that he's taken over from Eugenio Amos. In ninth place now is Steph Dusseldorp in the Hexis McLaren, interestingly. McLaren creeping into the picture ninth now. And in tenth place is number 16, Audi, which has been given over to Anthony Kumpen. Just look at the McLaren, Steph Dusseldorp. Two minutes, zero four. Bowed a second and a bit behind Makibiki. And band four. And Ramos in the end, 44. So, McLaren... By just being consistent, strong driver lineup as well, keeping out of trouble, using traffic, getting their way a little bit further up through the, the group of cars, and certainly into the top ten, which is a result. Well, Lucas Ordonyev did that great first stint, led the early laps. He's in the pit lane, and we can hear from him with Jack Nichols. Lucas, uh, great opening stint from you. Couldn't quite hold the lead though. Yeah. Uh... Well, fantastic, no? Fantastic to be in the, at the top of the grid and then a uh, good start. Uh, had a good start overtaking Darren on, on the first corner and then I tried to, to keep the tyres uh, on a good good position. Uh, then uh, I started to catch the, the slow cars, uh, the, the gentleman drivers, and one of the Audi closed me the door in, in the hairpin. I don't know why, I don't, they don't see the blue flags or something, but... I had a little contact with him and then I tried to check if the, the, the tire and, 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 and the direction was, was fine and uh, yeah, I found it was good but uh, Darren overtook me on the inside in the next corner and, and then I, I started to hold that pace to keep the tires on a good, uh, on a good uh, shape and yeah, good stint, happy with that and now Peter's in the car and uh, doing a great job so let's see. To, let's see how we can finish, but uh, looking good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Peter Pantera, just say, um, is running 2 minutes 04, dashed at 2 minutes 05.7. Probably got a bit of traffic, so running about two seconds on average. A lap slower than Luca Adonias was doing in his opening stint, of course. It's slightly easier because you weren't going to be having to deal with the, the traffic as it is now after the first round of pit stops. Peter Pizzera is about to be given a drive-through penalty for overtaking under yellow flags. It just came up on the timing screen, and so too is Francesco Castellacci. So two cars that have been really talked about a lot are about to have to serve a drive-through job. You don't do that in a virtual race screen, do you? Do you get a yellow flag on those? I don't know. What if you do, what do you do? Do you ignore it or come into the pit lane? There's a virtual race director who virtually tells you off. Well, now it's for real. Peter Pizzera is going to have a drive through, and so too is Castellacci. So Pizzera fifth, Castellacci seventh. There's the Nissan, and the word will get through. Come in, drive through looms for you. It's an awful, awful feeling. You really feel you've let the entire team down. You feel ashamed of your carelessness fundamentally. And uh, Peter Pizzera was going to have to make that. Do it earlier than at the end of the, the, the three laps that you're permitted to do it within. Get it over and done with, get back out on the racetrack and forget about it, move on. The good thing is, though, for this team, they are well ahead in the Pro-Am Cup. This car currently leads fifth overall and second in the class is 13th overall. And it's now the Harry Project driven GRT Grassa Racing Team Lamborghini. And then third in the class, a long way back again, is the redoubtable Louis Machiels, who is in 19th place overall in the AF Corsa Ferrari. So Pro-Am has a very different look to it this weekend. But at the moment, this Aston Martin is unstoppable. Fred Makaviki, the body language of this Aston Martin, completely different in my view to Darren Turner. Darren was just guiding the car, no physical effort or input. Fred Makaviki gets in, the visor comes down, and he is 100% driving the wheels off that car. Indeed, I was going to say wheel nuts, but obviously wheel nuts is a sensitive issue with that car because they don't have quite the ultimate setup on the Aston Martin, but he is doing everything that he currently can. 15 seconds ahead of Frank Stippler in second place in the lead Audi. And it's growing as well, getting yeah. that quicker last time. Yeah. Onto the hangar straight then comes the long, long line of cars, Nissan, Ferrari, Ferrari, Ferrari. Again, the 458 so, so popular within this championship. And, of course, the next stop for the series is Paul Ricard. And then we go to one of the highlights of the year, the Spa 24 hours, where we could be on for approaching 80 cars, John. Interesting concept. It is a longer circuit than Silverstone, but not hugely not so. Much. 24 hours around Spa-Francorchamps, rain, fog, 
Sunshine, great Belgian beer. Possibly snow. It's not unknown. You're looking at the Jones Mercedes getting out of the way of Steph Dusseldorf. Ninth look in the Hepsis McLaren working his way through traffic. And somebody's oh, off there. Car. That is one is that of the McLarens, no I think. Is that um, a Boots and Gignon car? And that looks like a rear suspension on the right rear. Uh, the car grabbing very, very much indeed. It's certainly, I would say that's a two link somewhere in the rear of the McLaren. I would Hard think. to tell, but it, it, the way it was grabbing it, it was more than a flat tire. I think that's 15, is it not? Which would be the Caraboge Marlene Brogi John Hartzorn car that crashed in the qualifying session at the start of the day. He's not had a good day, that car, no. at all. Going back just to think about Spa 24, yep. while we're looking at Ben Makiviki, the 24 hour race at Nurburgring just recently was uh, red flagged for about nine That's hours right. yep. simply because of the weather, and the Ardennes forest is not very far away from Spa. Very true. Let's hear from Darren Turner, though, because he did that tremendous opening stint. His car leads, and he is with Jack in the pits. Darren, great battle for the lead of the race there. You just managed to, uh, to get past. Yeah, I was quite lucky. There was a, a bit of an incident up ahead of Lucas, and uh, he had to back out and went one way, and it was a clean line for me on the left, and managed to squeeze past. But you know, even after that point, it was only traffic in between us that really dictated the gap. Um, you know, I could see on a clear lap he had the same pace as me, and you know, maybe I was a bit more fortunate through the traffic. But it was good. You know, it's our first run in the championship, first time trying to understand the tyres, and uh, you know, just trying to settle into the race, and. Uh, you know, very happy. The team's done a, good, done a good job to get the car, car to work with these tyres in such a such a short time. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Job well done by Darren Turner. But what else did we expect? No, it's a, it's, it is a superb driver lineup. You've got you know, youth, experience, aggression, everything with the three drivers: Darren Turner, Fred McAvicki, Stefan Nuka. Uh, but what's important is that Aston Martin have produced a car that's come in on a tyre which is not familiar with and you've got to work with Pirelli and get to find that sweet spot isn't easy once you've got it then you've got to maintain it over the, the duration of the one hour run that you're in and uh, that's what the team are doing Aston Martin Racing have done a great job with this particular car and uh, a great addition to Blompin let's hope this car might be persuaded to come back to Spa don't you because that would be another very very good entry if we could get that for the 24 hours it'd be an interesting entry because uh, that is a race where it is about consistency and uh, not taking risks three R races much more of a sprint variety even though they are endurance that's the title of this the blown by endurance race series but the endurance is maybe more from the, the gentleman trophy drivers the professional drivers they just drive this flat out maybe that's Jack's next challenge he needs to go and find John Gore the boss of Aston Martin Racing who is in the event himself co-driving with Phil Driver and see whether we can persuade them to do the Spa 24 hours Ahmed Ahati meantime uh, brought 66 Porsche in he's handed it over to Miro Konopka Miro not as quick as Ahmed Ahati but he comes over the timing line down towards Cops Corner John yeah, just get your braking right enter the car you can't quite see the apex of Cops Corner until you arrive at a great corner you carry a lot of speed into the corner because an awful lot of the racetrack on the outside and if you do have to run a slightly wide you can run certainly two wheels over then up through Maggots into Beckett's the left the right left and then the exit key to get a good drive off final part of Beckett's through Chapel Curve onto Hangar Strait traditionally this was the fastest part of Silverstone now I've been eclipsed by the Wellington Strait because the exit out of Beckett's through Chapel Curve isn't as quick as it is on the exit out of Aintree onto Wellington Strait. Then on the brakes, into Stu Corner. Just got to pick your braking point. You can't run down the inside if you're racing another car, but you have to be absolutely wheel to wheel alongside. Otherwise, the car on the outside will shut the door. And look at that, dives down the inside. And, well, there's an example of what you can do in Vale, and then they fight back for the Porsche. But the Nissan decides, no way, I'm going to take that ground. Runs wide on the exit, coming out of club. That was probably a bit of a shock for the Porsche because I don't think he had a clue that this was coming down the inside so quickly. Up to Walt Village, you can still see how busy it is out there. All the way around the lap near a Canop is hard to work. Experienced driver, and he did a part season in the championship last year. The car not very reliable, so they went away and have worked hard on it. And with the Omani driver bringing funding to the team this year, this is a good, solid run, 23rd overall at the moment. And we're not even at half distance. 
That's very true. And the car is also leading the Gentleman Trophy, class leading Porsche this. Music to my soul. <laughs> says Porsche fan Jay Watson. Right, coming out of Luffield in a moment will be Mira Konopka. His next target on track, interestingly, is Ludovic Bade. Remember the BMW that we saw early on and had the puncture and dropped almost at the tail of the field? But it's up to 22nd overall. So it shows that if you just stay out there and keep out of trouble, you can work your way back up the order. I mean, the key for these gentlemen drivers in particular is just doing precisely as I said, David. Stay clean, keep out of trouble. If and doubt, lift off. You're the professional drivers, different animal altogether. But for the gentleman drivers, the ones in the gentleman trophy, it's about just making sure consistency, metronomic driving is where you'll be, and you'll gain benefits out of it. The Fortec Mercedes, Ben Hetherington, is about to be given a driving standards flag. Ben, who was uh, racing here last weekend for Fortec in British GT and went very, very strongly. Uh, British driver Oliver Jarvis, by the way, up into 21st place now, having taken over from Harold Primat's double spinning Audi. Oliver's not having a terribly happy time in this championship thus far this year. Anthony Kumpen there, the Bel oh, hello, what's going on ahead of him? All sorts of silliness. Ferrari tripping over Nicky Katzberg's BMW. Oh, and just like they just simply uh, they made an error and yeah. lifted off the throttle dramatically. And that's, that's compromised Katzberg big Absolutely. time. Because now, 8th and ninth on nose to tail. Here they come down towards Stowe and Kumpen's got the momentum. But Nick Katzberg, we know, is a very quick young Dutch driver, so he should be able to respond from this. But the 73 Ferrari, I think it was, the car started by Frolov after its puncture, getting in the way once again. And that's certainly compromised Katzberg on this lap. Yeah, but he was easy. once he got into Stu corner ahead of the Audi, then he was pretty much assured he's got clear air. He can either then use the Audi and he's beginning to just fractionally in the edge of the club corner open up that gap but that's the danger you catch a slow car or, or an unpredictable car wrong part of the racetrack and then you're caught you're trapped and you've got to just wait until you move maneuver your way around and hopefully the traffic behind you that has seen the, the, the situation hasn't been able, able to read it too quickly and, and take advantage the sister car to this by the way the bat liner's entry was given over to yelma berman but it's now made three pit stops so clearly all is not well and it is now in 50th place and it's seven laps behind which in real terms means forget it yeah well it was basically once the incident occurred where uh, bat liner's got tagged uh, the time it took to get the car back to the pits and whatever repairs were affected nevertheless they still had a chance of doing something but uh, with those extra trips to the pit lane it's pretty much over which Nissan was that going wide at Cops was that 23 that's the second car in fact it's the Pro-Am Cup car from Al Masood I thought for a horrible moment it was Lucas Law but Lucas is the one behind him as they come through Beckett's now so not saying this car's not important but it's not one of the leading cars it's 23rd overall the Emirati driver at the wheel of it so at the moment Fred McAvee leading Frank Stippler by 19 and a half seconds give or take and continuing to build on that in Pro-Am the class is still being led by Peter Pizzera, the head of Harry Project, the Austrian in the Lamborghini, and third is Joe Osborne in the Barwell Ram Aston Martin. That's a quick car. I'm assuming Peter Pizzera has made his drive through. He has, yes. He's down to 10th place, so as bad as it was, he's still in the top 10. And, and they've got class. Alex Bunkham to jump into that car for that final stint, so all Pizzera must do is, but he's 1.2 seconds behind Krum in ninth place. He's got a chance of making a position. Yep. He can do that without jeopardising himself. But the real aim for that team is a Pro-Am Cup win, because they're not necessarily going to challenge for the Pro-Am Cup. They're not going to challenge for the podium, no. an overall position would be a real absolutely. bonus. Absolutely right, just, don't just rule about, them out. But it's also about experience, yeah. learning and uh, moving forward. Indeed so, Peter Pizzera learning with every corner, isn't he? And he's got some great circuits on which to learn. He's already done Monza, now Silverstone, Paul Ricard next, then Spa, and then the Nürburgring. We talked about the total 24 hours of Spa. Of course, the last round is 1,000 kilometres of the Nürburgring, and that's going to be another great event to round out the season. Championships there to be decided. You're looking at number one, Laurence Vantour, running in third place, and he's on the same kind of pace of Frank Stippler. Indeed, on that last lap, he was 6,000 slower. That's all. That's how evenly matched the Audis are. And the gap was 2.8 seconds as they came across tight finish line. So... Frank Stippler, often overlooked. I mean, Lawrence Van Four, who's chasing him, young guy, out of single-seater racing, pushes like mad. We've seen some great drives, certainly this year at Nagaro in the GT Series opening event. And Frank Stippler just gets in and drives, whether it's a GT car, whether it's an historic race car, he just drives the same way in every car, just makes the adaptation to the particular uh, discipline he's in. 
and last year he was the real hero of the Spa 24 hours because he did pretty much as much of the driving as it was possible under the regulations to, you know, to the minute and he was absolutely worn out by the end of it but he carried that car virtually to the win, he was an absolute star. He would be my kind of co-driver in a 24 hour yeah. race. Yeah, he's fast, he's dependable, no fuss about it, just gets on with it, he's consistent, quick, doesn't bounce off any of the traffic, just does the job properly. And just lets people like me do the daylight hours. <laughs> Frank Schnipper at the moment, though, is dropping away from Fast Freddy because Fred Makovicki now has a 20-second cushion. Schnipper is second. This car, Laurence Vantour, who's taken over from Stefan Ortelli, runs third. Fourth, currently, is Cesar Ramos in the Castle Racing Ferrari. But, at the moment, if you look down the order, where are we finding people turning in quick lap times and making up a little bit of progress? Well, one of them is Nick Katzberg in the BMW. The other is Steph Dusseldorf yep. in the Hexis McLaren. So there are still things to shake out of that leading gaggle. Yeah, I mean, the McLaren is showing, in relative terms, better pace in the race than it did in qualifying against the competition. But likewise, Ramos in the Ferrari is running a couple to three-tenths of a second a lap quicker than the two Audis. It's, it's a very small margin, and uh, he's currently, I think, about eight seconds behind the, the third-place Van Four Audi. Nevertheless, that Ferrari is just a little bit quicker than the two Audis ahead. So we've got Makaviki, the race leader, 20 seconds to the good at the moment from in second place Frank Stippler and Peter Pizzera's Nissan currently down in 10th place, a class leading 10th place, but 10th place nonetheless. And Fred Makaviki now is on lap number 43. This is the way that the Pro Cup looked. It is also the same as your top six overall. 20 seconds it is between the top two, but then only two seconds between second and third, and at the moment, Stippler is being caught by Lawrence Vantour, and that's going to be the next battle, I think, to keep an eye to, because that is developing nicely. 2.2 seconds as they came across the line, and Ramos and the Ferrari is a further, he's dropped. Let's have a quick look back at where we've been in the first half of the race. We're at the halfway point now, 90 minutes done, 90 to go. And this enormous field of 57 poured through Cops Corner, being headed by Lucas Odonia in the RJN run. Nissan, a good first stint by the Spanish driver. And he drove the Nissan GT Academy Team RJN entry in the opening stint ahead of Darren Turner for the bulk of it. Bas Linders was busy working his way through traffic early on. And he put himself onto the back of the battle for third place as the two leaders escaped. But it was Alexander Skriabin who had this whole line of cars queuing up behind him. And that line just got longer and longer. Drama early on, Harold Pimmer got muscled out of the way, had this spin at Rutland's. Nearly got collected by Lee Moser, who went wide in avoidance. Primat got back into the race and had another spin, and this was how the lead changed. Really opportunistic stuff by Darren Turner as they came across the slow McLaren ahead. He went one way, around the other side of the traffic went Lucas Ordonieff, and Darren Turner put himself on the right line for the next corner, up the inside going into the loop. The race lead was his, and having hit the front, he was then able to break away. Bas Linders, though, got attacked by Pierre Hershey coming out of farm. Big contact that spun the BMW around, put him in the gravel. The car recovered, but I think it's fair to say now has retired in the pit lane after three pit stops. It's effectively out altogether. At the driver change, Darren Turner gave way to Fred Makaviki, and not only did the car do 32 laps, it also went seven minutes after the hour, showing good fuel consumption in that car, as well as very impressive pace indeed. Behind, the Audi battle took up attention with Christopher Meese ahead of Stefan Ortelli. The car's now driven by Frank Stippler and Lawrence Van Tour. So, an hour and 28 minutes to go at Silverstone, round two of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series. Jack Nichols in the pits, David Addison and John Watson trackside, and we're looking at Fred Makaviki, who is continuing to build this lead, even allowing for the traffic that he keeps coming across. And really, in every corner, there's a bat marker that he needs to be aware of now. I mean, this is a part of what you've got to prepare for in endurance racing. You know there's going to be a lot of cars you're going to have to take, and they all will arise at a particular part of the racetrack, which will frustrate you, and it takes patience. It just takes good, clear thought. Don't let it get to you. Just make sure that when you make your overtaking manoeuvres that they are clean and executed. Don't dither. Otherwise, the driver who you are overtaking will not know what to do. In the meantime, the battle for third, second and third place, Lawrence Van Thor has run down Frank Stippler, he's taken about a second out of the gap, down to 1.2 seconds, so Lawrence Van Four has got momentum, and Frank Stippler will find himself under pressure within the next two to three laps. May have been, could have been traffic, 
you have to be wait and see. You can't always assume that it's down to Lawrence Van Thor, but the one lap certainly Stifter lost over a second to uh, Lawrence Van Thor. And the race leader comes down towards Cops Corner. Let's just wait and see what the gap is between the first car and then Frank Stippler in second place. You'll see what 20 seconds feels like in a moment. And just while we're waiting, let me answer another question from earlier on, because on Twitter, Matt Hunter tells me, John, that you can, in this virtual era of racing, have virtual race directors and stewards. You can all factor it into the game, and penalties can be applied accordingly. Now, second and third getting themselves together because Frank Stippler and Lawrence Van Tor, six tenths of a second apart when they came across the line. It is game on, isn't it now? Because you've got the Belgian Audi Club, Team WRT cars, plural, because they're out of the same stable, running together. And Frank Stippler is being caught by Lawrence Van Tor. This gap is coming down and down. The Belgian is on the back of the German driver now. Is that due to traffic? Or is that due to Lawrence Van Tor running quicker? There was one lap where Stippler lost a second, now that would not be normal, more likely it would be traffic, but the outcome is you've got the two ID Club drivers running virtually nose to tail, second and third, Stippler gets into Stowe just ahead of Van Thor, Van Thor maybe being a little bit cautious, not wanting to push the envelope and force the ID down the inside, he can do it, he can wait, he's done the right thing, waited until he came down to fail, now he can use the performance, get the drive off club, looks already to be slightly quicker through the exit of club than Frank Stippler is so game on for second place absolutely and this is because Van Tor has been chipping away lap after lap after lap he's gained a few tenths here a few tenths there add it all together and he's now almost up on the back of Stippler but even when he does close right up onto the tail of the German it's not going to be easy for him to get through and Frank Stippler guess what he's being warned about respecting the track limits so he's rising to the challenge here he's pushing on and he's using a bit more of Silverstone than the race director wants him to do but look at this because Laurence Van Tor is almost on the tail of him now can the Belgian make a move at Brooklyn? He's lining it up. I wonder what's going on in the pit lane, on the pit wall. What will be the information, not instruction, information given to both drivers? Clearly, if Lawrence Van Thor's lap times are consistently quicker than Frank Stippler, the team might encourage Frank Stippler to let Lawrence Van Thor go in the interest of pursuing a victory because they do not know at this stage, just after half distance, what may well happen in the, the remaining part of this one hour and so 24, 25 minutes. And, uh, you know, that's why you've got to give your driver who is running quicker the best chance. The gap as they came across the line was down to three tenths of a second. That's all between those two. And this is the fight that rages on. And all the time, of course, while they're squabbling, Fred Makabiki's going to build the lead even more, isn't he? Well, that's, into his hands. That's the reason why the team then comes into play. If nobody wants to give up the place no. because there's an instruction from the pit wall. But when you race in endurance racing, you do race as a team. Frank Stipper, watch. Now, as they turn their way through Stoke Corner and go down through Vale, let's have a look in this replay of the Nissan ahead. We're on board with Mira Konopka, and the Nissan ahead gets onto the grass and back on safely enough but that could have been quite a scary moment yeah i've been getting on the outside of chapel curve onto the grass and you've got a bridge there so the track actually effectively narrows down and you want to make sure you do nothing aggressive on your way back onto the racetrack as we go back to this battle for second and third place and frank stippler defending from his teammate Luke van thor now sees an opportunity with the traffic ahead goes wide on the entrance now tries to make the run up the outside but that traffic and frank stippler has slowed down Lawrence Van Thor. Van Thor still tries to undercut as they come through the exit of the loop. It's a, now is a chance for Van Thor. Can he make it work? Looking down. Uh, it's difficult because the, the Von Ryan McLaren is on the outside, the Ferrari on the inside. And Van Thor really not getting an opportunity. All he can do is look to go slightly wide on the entry into Luffield, then make the cutback and try and get alongside, but doesn't manage to do it. The Ferrari is really acting as a spoiler for Lawrence Van Thor and a frustration for Lawrence Van Thor. Over the timing line, once more, the gap just a tenth of a second now. And there is number one, so through goes Laurence Van Thor, but he runs a little bit wide this time over the kerb. You can see how much he's pushing, he's desperate to get through. Stefan Otelli watching on, 
and Edward Sandstrom in the background is also interested in this because he's one of the co-drivers for 13. They could not be closer. Fantastic racing this for second spot. Frank Stippler comes through the Beckett's S's. Staying away from the curb, where having a real bite of the curb, both in and out of Beckett's that time, was Lawrence Vantor, and he's right under the rear wing, down towards Stoke Corner. This should be the chance. He lines up, he pulls out, maybe a bit too soon, who knows, but up to the braking area they come. Is he going to be able to go through? Yes, Lawrence Vantor goes by, and Frank Stippler didn't make that that hard in the end. I think he realised it was a team idea to let him by. Absolutely, and he did it in a way where it doesn't look like he's been told to let Vantor go through. It was a clean overtake, it was well executed, judged and executed move by Lawrence Van Four, and uh, he may have come out a little bit early on Hangar Straight but he got the position and Frank Stippler sensibly didn't challenge, again running wide on the exit of club, not all four wheels but not awfully far away from all four wheels on the exit of club and driving standards flags to be shown to now Laurence Van Tour for not respecting the track limit so we did see him running wide and the race director has spotted it as well so now this gives us a new car up in the second place and this is the best that we've seen out of number one in the race it has not yet been in second position on pure pace it is now I just wonder what Laurence Van Tour can do to bring down 23.4 seconds worth of a gap that was the gap between uh, Frank Stippler yeah. and Fred Makovicki now once the overtake has taken place It'll probably actually extend slightly until Lawrence Van Four can get into his own rhythm, running ahead of his teammate, and see if he can make any challenge. The last lap for the two Ardys were just about a second plus slower than that from Fred McEvicky in the Aston Martin leading. Now, Stefan Ortelli has just watched his Audi get up into second place. What are his feelings as he watches all of that? Let's find out. He's with Jack. Stefan Ortelli, I think once we have our small technical glitch restored, but we will, I promise you, hear from a Formula Mont winner in due course. Um, Unless Stefan's speechless. Well, with, with excitement, it's possible, isn't it? Uh, he's lost his voice by cheering so much for the efforts of Laurence Van Tour, who's got himself now into second place. And we've got a report that number 70, which is the Scriabin Bassoff Alessandro Pierre Guidi Ferrari, has got a loose rear diffuser. What? Well, yep. let's just see what's happening at Stowe. Bit of tar smoke settling. Have we got a drama? Well, let's go back to the pits and hear from Stefan Ortelli. Stefan, uh, Lauren's managed to make the move then in the end. Team play at all? I know. Uh, it's not really only the team play. I think it's, uh, it's a bit more quicker here. Uh, Frank uh, never drove here since 10 years, I think, but he's doing a, a very good job as well. I think we are all pretty much the same, but apparently it was a bit the same with me and Chris Smith in the first uh, run. We get more and more quicker than uh, the other car through the stint. So with the tyres, I think we managed to do it better. And uh, I think uh, the target is trying to see if we can catch the Aston, you know, not only uh, finishing second or third, but trying to see if we can do anything against the Aston Martin, which seems to be very strong. You think it's a realistic chance for you to get the Aston? We, we, we will try. I mean, we will try. They are very hard to beat. Uh, but uh, we are strong and we will try it, for sure. Thank you, Devon. Well, so I'm happy with that, and it uh, should be his teammate, Lawrence Van Thor, dropping immediately into the 2-0-4s once he's got past Frank Stippler. Interestingly, also, Lucas Lure in fifth place, actually running quicker than any of the top four cars, uh, with a 2-4.4 in the Nissan. This is a battle for sixth that's all changing because Steph Dusseldorp has gone sixth, up to seventh has gone Katzberg, and down to eighth has gone Nicky Mar, uh, Mar Melhoff. It's all been shuffled around coming through Club Corner. So the McLaren of Steph Dusseldorp, the car run by Hexis, is starting to become a bit more of a factor. I'm not suggesting it's going to win, but we've now got a McLaren into the top six. Podium may be come the end because we know that there's going to be, uh, for the third stint into that car, Alvaro Perez, and he's very, very rapid indeed. Well, Alvaro Perez is the, the man who's really done the development work, as we look and see, there's a little battle coming down, it's the replay of that overtake. Easy, really, for Lawrence Van Thor into Stoke Corner, and uh, Rani Rass in the garage looking and smiling, <laughs> almost embarrassed, <laughs> Rani, don't be embarrassed. Nobody asked that overtake to be done, it was a natural racing pass. And Rene Rass, good to have him competitive again because he had a big accident in a German GT round at Spa a few weeks ago and uh, he has bounced back from that undaunted, very much the Porsche Super Cup champion, Spa 24-hour winner last year and uh, he's going to be, again, a real factor when you get him behind the wheel for the third stint of the race. There's number two, which is the Mar Melhoff Audi driving back a little bit. So Steph Dusseldorp up now into the top six. His last lap was a 2 minutes 5.3. 
quicker than one or two of those ahead of him, but of course those have been doing a bit of squabbling, and there's also the traffic to factor into this. That car now is over a minute away from the race leader and 24 seconds away from his next target. Yeah, but the trouble is the next target is Lucas Lure, who's actually pulling away from Stan yeah. yeah. So he's got himself into sixth place, a good drive, and I mean a well-earned drive for the hard work that's gone into that Hexes without McLaren this weekend. But Lucas Lure, really, of all the top six drivers, the one that I'm focusing on, he is consistently quicker than those cars ahead of him. And uh, he's just doing a typical Lucas Lure job, head down, in traffic, and he's so used to driving in traffic as he does every weekend in North America, where the traffic is much, much more difficult than we're seeing in Silverstone. We have the replay of that overtake, and now this is what is going on coming down through Vale because you can see how much pressure Dusseldorp is under. Nick Katzberg upholding Mark VDS honour is right there behind him, and ahead is the mirror image of Lucas Lure's car, that's the Khamed al-Masoud car, but now look at Katzberg getting all toe, he looks to the inside as they go up towards Abbey, but he's defended by Dusseldorp who pounces on the slower car, through he goes and Katzberg sits absolutely on the back of him, if the McLaren's going through, he's going to follow because he can't afford to waste a single tenth of a second. Correct, and that's the way you do it, I mean, it puts a lot of pressure on the Nissan to make sure that he is aware there are two cars looking to go again, not to go around the outside, but to make the undercut, Whoa! and he's got it. Has he got it? Can he sustain it through eight trees, side by side, two cars, and they make it through, and Katzberg's on the inside, forcing Staff Dusseldorf off onto the outside, almost two wheels onto the grass. Superb racing, and it's not done yet, because look how late Staff Dusseldorf breaks, but he's on the outside line, they're almost touching, going into Brooklands, they're still side by side, Katzberg is just ahead, is he going to get the place going up towards Lafayette? He is, he moves across, he takes the line, brilliant racing. Great racing by two young drivers, racing wheel to wheel, clean racing. They gave each other just about enough room, didn't have contact as they came out of the loop through Aintree, down Wellington Street, into Brooklyn and then into Luffield. And uh, that's what I like to see, a good, serious racing, but clean racing. Great stuff, this, and there behind is Nicky Mar Melnhoff, who's trying to get himself through the traffic. Ninth is Anthony Kump, and tenth still is Peter Pizzera. Right, uh, number 180 has copped to drive through penalty for not respecting the track limits. That's Joe Osborne, and driving standards flags are now being thrown to Oliver Jarvis and also to Frank Stippler for not respecting the track limits. Stippler third, Oliver Jarvis in 21st. Now let's have a look in replay if we can at how Steph Dusseldorp was able to gain ground a little bit earlier on as the cars came down towards Stowe and ahead is the Mar Melhoff Audi and right round the outside goes Steph Dusseldorp and that is a very brave because it's an incredibly fast part of the circuit still, isn't it, that? Yeah, it is, and also you're going to get a lot of rubber rolling off the, the racing line onto the outside of the corner so you will get some pickup as Baz Lyne just has a little look at that moment. And uh, he's happy enough with Nicky Katzberg's performance. Uh, good drive by Katzberg, and in fact, for that matter, uh, by Dusseldorp to not put the two cars into jeopardy. You saw Yelma Berman in the background watching on, and that means that the car is not circulating anymore. Car three, it's all down to number four BMW to uphold honour. And this car this year is completely transformed. Last year, number four was very much cannon fodder, but this season it's very competitive indeed. Shuffle around of drivers. Nick Katzberg came into the team for Navara last year, and as you've just seen in the last few laps, he's a really big asset to the team. Former Euro Cup McGann Trophy winner, GT3 champion, and now running in uh, sixth place, having taken over from Henri Moser. Down towards Brooklyn's he goes, and this, for the moment, is the best placed BMW. And also, as every lap, or not every lap, every sector on this lap, personal best yeah. for Nicky Katzberg. So he's got a, a charge now to try and make some leeway, get some headway into the fifth position of Lucas Lure, who's settling back into the two-minute 4.7 second laps. That's right, and then behind this BMW dropping away again is the troubled McLaren of Steph Dusseldorp. I say troubled because all the McLarens are just a bit subdued for whatever reason, they are not developing. Lawrence Vantour has just gone quicker in the first sector than he has here the two, and we've also now got Nick Katzberg doing a personal best lap in the number four BMW, and out of the leading group, he is the quickest of them on circuit at the moment. Admittedly, a clear lap. There, it's a, it's but a clear lap, nevertheless, it all adds to your position. So that's a substantial lap from Nicky Katzberg, personal best in all three sectors. To get all three sectors in relative terms, clear to be able to do that um, is pretty much fortuitous but he's made best use of it, look at the gap he's already pulled yeah. on Steph Dusseldorp in the space of two laps so the BMW going very strongly indeed in the top six at the moment 
working through traffic lower down the order. You can see the Nissans getting themselves together. And Khamed al Masood, they're losing out. Another one being warned about track limits is now Steph Dusseldorp. Almost everybody we see in a battle then cops for the warning because they put so much effort into fighting, they just step the wrong side of that white line. Yeah, and, and I suspect the majority of these infringements are coming here at the exit of Club Corner where it is very easy just to free a car up on the exit there. You can see pretty much everybody is doing identical things. Now, it's a question of whether you prepare to let them get away with it or whether you decide if one is just transgressing fractionally more than the remainder, then, then he's the one that will get the penalty. Repeated offences are really what's going to earn you the penalty. As you see, Peter Pizzera now coming up to the loop. He is in 10 spots. Well, Baz Linders has not had a great day. Let's hear why. Oh, Baz, uh, a bit of a difficult race so far for you. Well, yes, um, the start went OK, and then uh, I was uh, a little bit quicker than the cars in front of me. But then we caught up uh, to some slower cars, and there was a gentleman driving an Audi, and uh, it led past the car in front of me. And I just followed and uh, even left space for him to, to continue if this was needed, but then it hit me on my left rear. And the car spun. Uh, left uh, rear tire was uh, blown, damaged. Um, and I was stuck into the gravel, so it took three laps. And um, so when we got back, um, the race is over. So what do you think you can do from here? Just get as many positions as possible? Uh, we, we DNF'd. We are in the box. So, I mean the other cars. So the other cars. Of course, uh, yeah, you know, the other car is doing a good job. It started 22nd on the grid. Uh, it's now in P6, I think. Nicky is doing a really, really good job. Marcus is still in uh, after this, so I think uh, I mean, we will manage to top five and uh, maybe with a bit of luck still on the podium. Thank you, Baz. Modern day endurance regulations, of course, mean that you can only drive the car that you are nominated for. You can't do car swapping anymore, but go back to the 1980s, John, think back to your Group C days, that was something that teams would do if a quick driver's car fell out of the race early on, he'd suddenly get drafted into another car and keep in the race, wouldn't he? Well, I mean, I remember at, at Le Mans, uh, where drivers were being swapped around yeah. in the race, yeah. if one driver was underperforming in one car and another driver had had a problem with that car, they were immediately taken out and uh, the hot rod would get into that particular car. It's not what I actually think is correct. I think the three drivers or the two drivers in those days should be the drivers that drive the car. But it's a team sport. It's not an individual sport. And that's the replay of that manoeuvre. I mean, a really bit of great bit of motor racing from two drivers just about giving each other a margin for error. Steph Dusseldorp on the outside coming down into Brooklyn to have the opportunity to break fractionally later than Katzberg and the BMW on the inside, but never really was able to force the issue on the exit but principally on the entry into Luffield and once Katzberg got that position he had control of uh, fifth place. And just wonderful Sixth racing place. that because all up the curb was Nick Katzberg there was just enough room but only just enough and we've got another drive-through being issued and it is going to go the way of the Dennis Anderson Martin Jensen Ferrari for not respecting the track limits that's the John Gore Phil Dreiber Aston Martin in the pit lane and Let's just uh, catch up on one or two things from the pit lane. Jack has been busy finding things out. Jack, what have you got for us? Well, we've got a couple of retirements, unfortunately. We've noticed that the 24 Blanc Pan Reiter Lamborghini's out of the race. That's after damage. Uh, in the opening few laps, Mark Hayak was hit into the side by, he claims, the number 77 McLaren. Uh, so, unfortunately, that's them out of the race. And also the number 12 ART car, the car that Gregoire de Moustier lost the front right wheel off, Losing that wheel also seems to have damaged the ABS, so they've got no ABS and they're out of the race as well. OK, thanks, Jack. Your next target is to go and find out, if you can, what happened to the Peter Dumbreck Nissan in that first pit stop, because it seemed to be in the pits for a long, long time, and it certainly tumbled down the order. Lucas Law is now fifth, but there's still something attached to that story, I think, but we've never quite got to the bottom of it. It seemed to lose a heap of time within the uh, first pit stop. So... What have we got now? An hour and eight minutes to go. Time flies in block pan, doesn't it, John? Well, I mean, it is a motor race. It's not an endurance race. These are flat-out, three-hour, effectively, sprint endurance races, and that's not a contradiction. And uh, we're seeing such a high standard of driving, ability and quality of drivers, particularly in the Pro Cup, but all the way through the field, that, that it's just driving the pace of these block pan enduro events at a level which, you know, when I was aware of the series beginning, I didn't see it. it uh, I think it's fantastic. 
the lead gap is coming down a bit. Now, this might be traffic. It might be as much Lawrence Van Tour pushing, but he's taken over a second out of Fred Makovicki. So the gap between the top two, which was hovering around the 22nd mark, is now 18.6. Third is still Stippler, and fourth is Ramos, and fifth is Lua. Sixth is Katzberg, seventh is Dussulo, eighth is Mar Melhoff. Uh, in ninth place, it is Anthony Kumpen, and a class-leading tenth is still Peter Pizzira in the Nissan and we are almost at the next hour mark, so we're almost at the next round of pit stops. And I mention that because in the context of car 35, Alex Bunker is all teed up, ready to get into that, and he was the man that was quickest in Q3, so number 35's chances should get even better in the next stint. And what's this? Three wide coming up towards Village. Miro Konopka in the middle, and Fred Makovicki trying to work his way through traffic, but being suitably circumspect. Chops around the outside of the Slovakian driver. Kropka at the wheel of the Porsche, and he's about to see Fred Makovicki's Aston Martin shrink because it will pull away and just disappear into a dot on the horizon. Car 57, fastest sector time of anybody on lap 53 in the last sector. That's Francesco Castellacci up to his tricks. He was doing that early on, wasn't he? And he caught that drive through, which he did his did last, take. last lap 203. The man's possessed. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not a man yet, he's a boy still. Yes, but he's not, man. he's not the only one in the threes because also Cesar Ramos has done a two minutes three, both Ferraris. Yeah, but also Ramos was aware that Lucas Lua was running consistently quickly yeah. and by consistently knocking out laps in the two minutes four second lap for a long, long time and was little bit by little bit eating into the, the gap between fourth and fifth and Ramos suddenly now has got the message. The Beach Dean ice cream Aston Martin is in for the uh, company owner, Andrew Howard, to give way to Johnny Adam. And the Beach Dean team, a very welcome addition to the Blanc Pan Endurance Series this year because they bring lots of ice cream with them. And the mint chop chip was very welcome at lunchtime. So Andrew Howard, who races as well as runs the business, ex-mini racer, hands over to Johnny Adam, who is very, very rapid indeed in this car. But of course, with that gearbox problem early on, they are eight laps down, so they go to gain places partly by pace but partly by others having problems but if they can stay out there and get some class points it's worth persevering isn't it it's, it's all about finishing yeah it's one thing being a hero and being quick but if you're not finishing uh, in endurance racing that's what it's all about so down the pit lane goes the fastest ice cream van in the world the beach dean ice cream aston martin goes back into the race and we have got now the cars working lap number 55 now in the gentleman trophy class it was being led by Miro Konopka we've had a change there this is now the Ferrari that leads the class and it is Lionel Camo who took the car over from Luke Payard and is going strongly we don't see very much these days of uh, Lionel Camo in racing uh, arthritis uh, sufferer and so he has to limit his racing and he's a uh, very busy fundraiser for a charity as well uh, now as we look at the gentleman trophy top two back to the pit lane Jack what have you discovered now uh, that Nissan pit stop you asked about, Adders, uh, unfortunately it was nothing more complex than a sticky wheel nut. Nigel ah, Stepney right. reckons it lost them about 10 seconds or so, so that's where the time was lost for them. Brilliant, thanks for that. Well, it may only be 10 seconds, but John, at this level of racing, you can't afford to lose 10 seconds, can you? No, not at all, and uh, you know, you see Lucas Law has had to drive very, very hard to try and recover last round, he's done a reasonable job, he's now 17 seconds behind Ramos in the Ferrari in fourth place, but sort of now is stalled out because Ramos has responded running much the same lap times within two or three tenths of a second and uh, the gap between Lucas Lure and Van Four it had dropped down to 17 seconds behind this car the lead Aston Martin and Fred Makovicki it's now back up again to 18 seconds I mean it's just the, the rub of yeah. the green literally between where you catch traffic one getting it in the wrong place one getting it at the right place so fundamentally the gap has remained unchanged Makovicki controlling it from the front comfortably running now the last lap two minutes oh three point six against a lap almost a second slower from Van Thor nothing to do with the drivers it's just simply where they're catching the traffic and how they're being able to manage it We've had contact between Peter Mann's Ferrari and Leon Price's McLaren apparently out on track. That's just being reported as uh, Fred Makovicki gets held up a little bit here in the traffic. It's the uh, Howard Blank Ferrari just up ahead of him, the American driver. And you can see it in the red, white and blue colours. Through on the inside now goes Fred Makovicki, easily through the traffic now. But he doesn't want to get too unnecessarily caught up, doesn't want to take any risks. In going no, no, by. he had to go really quite far over to the right, up almost against the pit wall down by the wing 
uh, to make sure he got clear of the first of the two Ferraris and he just about had enough momentum as the Dusseldorf car comes in for its second stop and just had enough momentum to get into Abbey ahead of the second Ferrari so the, the rather tall Steph Dusseldorf gets out of that car and the more stocky uh, Alvaro Parent and that was a good run from Steph Dusseldorf and a car that when we watched qualifying this morning I thought was as big a handful as I've ever seen a race car here at Silverstone it just did not look comfortable it didn't so much bounce through back it's it lowered it well, had absolutely top, no poise at all skipped and jumped yes. literally and that is no exaggeration but they've turned it around and Philippe Dumas' team now looking a bit more competitive as the race wears off. Well, we're almost at the end of the second hour, and that therefore means, as you can see, that we're now back into pit stops, and Alvaro Parent is the quickest driver in this car, so why not give him the maximum track time available? And away he goes, blasts down the pit lane. Also, Anthony Kumpen has just come in in the number 16 Audi to give way to Marcus Winkelhock. So you've got teams now starting to put the quick driver in. Louis Machiels has just pitted also in number 50, and that will give the car to Andrea Bertolini, but he's down in 19th place. He's been a very subdued Ferrari, that, in the pro Am Cup for this race. The AF Corsa car has not sparkled all weekend. This is Konopka, who comes in to give back to Ahmad al Hati. As he gets, fuel in. Ahmad races portions for a different team in British GP, uh, British GT, rather, for Motorbase, and now into the ARC Bratislava car for Blanca. Lucas Lure is in, out of fifth place there, number 23, Nissan. But we know that Fred Makovic, if he needs to, can keep going for another three or four laps after this. Yeah, I was going to give Stefan Muka, in relative terms, a comfortable ride to the end. And uh, it'll now really be, in a way, which of all the teams in the pit lane were miserly with their tyres in qualifying and some teams did, I think one of the Nissans may well have opted to save a set of tyres back so that when it came to the final run they had fresher rubber than the opposition run and that certainly is worth time until that tyre then settles down and begins to stabilise. Mar Malhoff in the pits, Pizzera in the pits, Castellacci in the pits. So now the 35 Nissan with Alex Buncombe at the wheel becomes one to watch. And so to be fair, that's 57 Ferrari. Giacomo Petrobelli will get into that car. More pit stops cycling through. That's the Santelok team hard at work uh, with Pierre Hershey being replaced in 41 uh, by Claude Yves Gosselin, next Formula 3000 racer many, many years ago. And also the Fortec Mercedes has just come in. Stephen Jelly has done uh, his opening stint, so Ollie Hancock it should be to bring the car home to the end. Well, we started with 57, and we've lost a few through mechanical dramas and damage, but still pounding on remorselessly up front. They are at McLaren to hold them up. Coming into Stowe Corner, just the momentum, so difficult to let go. We struggled a lot during all the practices and uh, qualification. So fortunately, just 24th with the qualification. Then again, we lost a lot of places. We dropped down to 47 because we got spun around. But I think uh, Alex showed a great uh, great race, great scent. I think the, the pace we set in the race is, is quite good, promising, and I think it's not our favorite track, but definitely we do our best here and hello, score hello, as much points as possible. And what do you think you can do from here then? Where do you think you can realistically finish? Um, I have no idea. I think we're finished. We're now on P8. Uh, I hope top five. Alvaro will attack as much as he can. Top five will be very, very good. Thanks, Steph. So, another job well done by Steph to Saloum. And he's now out of his hands. But if you want a quick McLaren, you put Alvaro Perrin behind the wheel. He's one of a number of McLaren factory drivers who are both sympathetic to the car, but very, very quick. Indeed he is. And uh, Alvaro will go out and uh, literally whatever is possible in an MP4 12C McLaren. Well extracted. That Nissan is in trouble and it's 32 that's stopped by the side of the circuit. That's the Mark car that Shalitsky. is driven by Mark Zitsky, yeah. 
and it's a bit smoky. And so that was the other RJN car. And it's got a fire by the look of it because yes. Marshall Ziski very keen to get the marshals to douse whatever it is that's making it hot and bothered at the front, but that's the day done. It's, I suspect a sort of liquid of some description has uh, ruptured, whether it's mechanical or whether it's just a, simply a, a, a line, but uh, hot brakes and liquid, uh, they don't like one another. Shaliski very keen to make sure that the marshal aims the fire bottle at the relevant place. And he also needs to make sure he's turned all the switches off because he doesn't want more fuel pumping through yeah. there. So well, I don't know what it is. I'm not sure it's fuel. I mean, it, it could be any form of fluid because those discs get so hot that if, if it does happen to be hydraulic fuel, hydraulic fluid from power steering or a brake fluid, it'll ignite. And uh, anyway, the marshal seemed to have sorted it out without any difficulty as Fred McAbeek continues on his way. Still running with less than an hour, 56 minutes remaining. We saw the Aston run one hour and three minutes into the race before Darren Turner brought it in. And uh, Fred McAbeeke should be able to do a similar stint, assuming he hasn't been too aggressive on the throttle pedal. Gets through cleanly and just slides the tail of the Aston as they come out of the loop. And Fred really very much enjoys driving a car where he controls the lot of the car by the throttle as much as he does by the steering wheel. The danger of doing that is, of course, that you can slightly overuse your tyre, but uh, the Aston, the balance of this car, throughout practice, qualifying and the race has been fantastic. And whether it's Darren Turner or Fred McAvicki to date, that car has looked absolutely flawless. Over the line goes the Aston Martin, 59 laps down. Frank Stippler has pitted from second place and... That puts Edward Sandstrom now into the car, but it should be the 44 Kessel Ferrari that moves up into second spot this time. Nick Katzberg has come in as well to give way to Marcus Paltela. So working their way through the Beckett's S's, we're into the final 56 minutes of the race, and Fred McAvicki has actually had a moderately easy stint. He's had to preserve the lead, and he's had all the traffic to worry about, but he's not had to fight too much for position. There's the Kessel Racing Ferrari creeping back into the picture, and in fact, it won't inherit second place, it will pit. So Cesar Ramos comes in. Daniel Zampieri will do the last stint behind the wheel of this car. And he comes. So it's the Aston continuing, and yet again, it's able to go a long way on a tank of fuel. And Ramos, as we see in the pit lane, drives down towards the end of this long Silverstone pit lane. And the beauty of being at the very end of the pit lane is that when you leave your pit box, you're virtually across the pit lane speed limit line, and then you're hard on the throttle. So... So Ramos in, San Pierre to take over, Makavica continues on his merry way, that's the Leon Price McLaren getting uh, involved with Ferraris out on track, the car that Rob Barth caught the penalty for earlier on, and so now, in fact, Leon Price has given away to Jordan Grogor for the last in, 33rd, the Von Ryan McLaren. It's a shame Rob had that yellow flag infringement, because at Monza he was an absolute hero, wasn't he, in the first stint, and you could probably rely job. on him to just look charge up the order. Look at the traffic, <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, he's brilliant. Cars everywhere. And in the midst of all of that is Alvaro Parent. Look, he's trying to fish his way through. Go left, go right. Wherever there's a bit of a gap, he's got to go for it. Big thing is he's got fresh uh, yeah. tyres than those around him, which is a significant advantage. And uh, as long as you don't abuse them too soon, then you will gain time. But just you have to pick and thread your way through that traffic quickly and cleanly. Over the timing line comes a lead lap Audi versus traffic. And as over the line has gone, Fred Makavicki up the inside there goes number 13, Edward Sandstrom. Now, he's lost a lap on that pit stop. So, of course, Fred Makavicki staying out for a long time. Yellow flag being waved up at Beckett because there's a car off there and was being attended to by the snatch vehicle. So it's a yellow flag zone preventing overtaking. And as the Audi turns its way through, we will see Fred Makavicki, of course, that car lose the time that it's gained when it cycles through the next round of pit stops. So some of the gaps are inflated. The yellow flag was for the Shulzitsky Nissan. You can see being towed away. Yeah, I mean, a, and a fairly substantial two vehicles to take the Nissan to safety behind the barriers. Always a concern at any racetrack when vehicles of that size are brought into play because not every driver does respect a waved yellow flag and some of them sometimes 
get perilously close to those vehicles when they are removing a, a car that is no longer taking part. In the meantime, Makifiki is still knocking out really quick laps at the very end of his stint. 203.2 on his last lap, that was lap 60. On to lap 61 now as the Ferrari back out to San Pedri, or San Pedri in that car. But that's really car from Monza. Yeah, not pitched. quite able to achieve the same accolade so far. We we'll see what happens when everything filters through. But it's gained on the pit stops, hasn't it? Because it was fourth behind the Audis and now it's second, so it's managed to jump up ahead of the Rene Rast car. But the one that's lost out on the second round of pit stops was Edward Sandstrom because that car has gone from being second, then third, down to sixth place. So the real beneficiary, again, as we saw at Monza, uh, the Kessel Racing team much, much better this year on pit stops. Last year, the pit stops were a bit Fred Carnot circus-like for that team on occasions, but this year, very well drilled indeed, and it's really paying dividends because now, as you can see, that car is right back into contention once again. Coming out of Woodcut in a moment, up over the timing line. There's the leader, Fred McAvicki, and what's he doing, John? Staying out. I'm not going to say anything again. I mean, <laughs> this Aston Martin must have run... It must be able to run in fumes. Well, it's got great fuel consumption, well, hasn't they, it? They seem to me have had the best fuel consumption yeah. of everybody out there. Now, that's not just simply about the engine, it's about lots of other factors, particularly aerodynamic efficiency, whereas it is using its fuel just better than for horsepower per horsepower than anybody else. Well, it went seven minutes past the first hour, so factor that in, and it's going to be on for going something like... Uh, 11 minutes over the next hour. That's the Beach Dean team who have done all of their scheduled pit stops for the day, but there are concerned faces there suggesting that either number 99 still has a problem or they're out of ice cream. There's the leader coming out of club. Just behind is the Francesco Castellacci Ferrari that's now been given over to Giacomo Petrobelli. And there's a 20 second stop go penalty for the Ferrari to be driven by Dennis Anderson and Martin Jensen for not taking a drive through. And the team manager of number four, VDS BMW, is now going to the race director. Kuching! Indeed. Kuching! Leader almost put off line there. Look, by the 75 Pro Speed Porsche, the Maxim Sule car, he's now thrown on the inside. That Pro Speed 911 has really struggled this weekend. For whatever reason, it's just really not looked in the game. Yeah, but he's trying to come back again yeah. at the race leader when really he's being lapped, he has no need to do so. You know, sometimes the red mist just descends arbitrarily. But Fred Makovicki, as you would expect, to be fair, because as we said at the start of his stint, he is very much one of the best GT racers out there, has done a solid job, and he comes through Woodcut Corner, and I think he might possibly think about staying out for another lap here. Well, you got that one right again, didn't you? <laughs> Thought I was clever. Over the line, yet another lap done. 49 minutes, amazing. That car is doing... I mean, unbelievable consumption. So up towards Beckett goes Fred Makovicki, leading the way, and Rene Rass, now that the pit stops have cycled through, is back up into second spot. But can he do anything at all about catching what's going to be Stefan Mucker in real terms? It'll be very difficult in reality. Stefan Mucker, the match for Makovicki or Darren Turner. As long as Stefan Mucker doesn't get a fit of them again, that old familiar red mist he has in the past suckered for it. Hopefully he has learned from it, but there's no guarantee he has. Now that's the second place Audi. That is Rene Rast making his way up towards Abbey. His last lap was a two minutes five, so in other words, he was dropping away from Fred Makovicki on that last lap through. Up towards Village comes number one. Losing a touch of time over each lap, the gap widening once more. In third place, but yet to do its second stop as well, is the Harry Prochik Lamborghini, that's now leading the Pro-Am class. And Alex Buncombe's Nissan, which seemed to have a very slow second stop, uh, is still down in 13th place. And Aston Martin think they might possibly, possibly put Stefan Booker in before much longer. I think that's a good idea, bring the car in. We know we're going to have a slightly slower pit stop due to the the nature of the wheel hub, wheel nut design on the Aston Martin. Uh, but they've done such a outstanding job on the racetrack. And in fact, they've done a very, very good job in the pit lane as well, albeit having to work around something that 
is slightly slower than their principal competitors. And wait and see as the acid as it does make its cut into the pit lane. So finally, after 40, with 47 minutes and 30 seconds or so to go, well, that's going to be a short step as Darren Turner stands back and he looks happy with the work that's been done by Fred Makaviki. And of course, Darren did a great job himself to take the lead about a third of the way through his stint. So Stefan Mucker will now take over that car. And he gets strapped in. So, of course, while the car is stationary like this, this gives Rene Ras, doesn't it, a chance to push on and try to bring down that gap. So it's a fight between those two when the Aston comes back out. Yeah, the trouble was Rene Ras' last lap was at two minutes and five. Now, again, traffic is a factor and all that, no doubt. But he needs to be running a lot quicker and consistently so as well to try and eat into any opportunity that may arise with Stefan Mucha behind the wheel of the Aston for their final stint as one wheels off, another on, and then down to the rear left. Observers watching to ensure that no more than two of the engineers at a time, as well as the man on the board, the lollipop. So lights are on, and uh, the jack is released. Come on, Stefan Mucha, get that car back out again. You're going to have to drive. Because there is the second place ID, I think, or the, yeah. what will effectively be the second place ID of Rennie Rast. It's still going to be a big gap, though, isn't it? Because he's got the whole of the stadium to go as the Aston is going down the pit lane, but then out onto Cops Corner. So it's still going to be, I would have thought, round about the 22nd mark, which will be the lead gap, we'll see. But Rene Rast now, who came to prominence by winning Volkswagen one make championships in Germany and then the Carrera Cup, I rather hoped he might get an Audi DTM drive, but... Uh, instead, he's been channeled this way. He did have an Audi DTM test. He did. And the reason he didn't get the drive was he couldn't get on with the levels of downforce Precisely. from the DTM car. Which is why Mercedes take people like Pascal Wehrlein straight from F3 into the DTM and why Rene Ras goes the GT route. So, yeah, yeah, he's, he's on the it's, Audi books. It's, it's very difficult to go from high downforce to low downforce. Yeah. But I've never heard of it being difficult to go from low downforce to high downforce. But in the case of Rene Ras, that was uh, the issue. Indeed, and in fact, so. I've, when I spoke to Vincent Voss the other day about other potential drivers in this car, it isn't always the case that drivers can step down or step up, depending on uh, what they've been accustomed to principally throughout their career. But the good thing is that Audi has not shunned him, having uh, helped Audi to win the Spa 24 hours last year. Wolfgang Ulrich's squad keeps him on the books and to go racing in GT categories. And so Rene Ras now proving he can do more than just win in Porsches. Now this is the leader at Stefan Mucker on his outlap. So it's really at the end of the next one when we'll get an idea of his pace relative to Rene Ras. But what we will get at the end of this, lap 64, is the gap. And then we'll start to monitor it, whether it goes up or down. I was just doing some quick calculations as to whether Stefan Mucker would be able to do enough driving to score points, and he will. You've got to do 20% of the race uh, to score points. That's 36 minutes, and he got in with 46 minutes, so he's OK. He's, but he's he won't safe. have to do very much. No, all he's got to do is just simply drive in the manner his two teammates have driven, and that is exemplary, uh, and not take risks, and not get frustrated if you get held up, you lose a second or two seconds in one sector of the racetrack. Don't let the frustration get to you. Remember, you've currently got a lead. We'll wait and see now as he goes across the start finish line. The clock will start to see the gap between the Audi and second place. There it is. And uh, the lead, Aston Martin. So uh, Rennie Ras comes through Luffield now. Going, it's maybe going to be less than 18 seconds. We have to wait for the clocks to stop as he goes across the line. 17.05. So maybe a second. Uh, of a loss on that opening lap for Stefan Mucha. Well, the next question is, what is a Mucha pace to a Rast pace? Well, Fred Makaviki has done a great job, and he's with Jack in the pits. Fred, great drive, great stint, and it's looking good for Stefan now. Yeah, yeah now we... Uh, Darren did, did a great job in for, for the first stint. He, he helped us because he took a good target to compare the T2. And then my, my stint was good. Uh, the car was really nice to drive. Uh, I, I try to be really safe in the traffic because it's really easy to do a mistake and uh, because it, when we arrive on the group uh, the different drivers fight uh, together and uh, they don't look in the mirror and that's why I try to be safe but the cash is really really competitive. Thank you. Welcome. So Fred Makaviki work done, watches now as Stefan Mucker turns his way up through Abbey 
and has got the beach dean Aston, I think, up the road ahead of him. So we're on lap 65, and we are on 42 and a half minutes, give or take, still to run. So coming out through the loop is the 97 Aston Martin, and the gap was, as John said, 17 seconds going on to this lap, but we're about to see for the first time, really, uh, what a Stefan Mucker flying lap is relative to a Rene Rast flying lap. I would say at the minute it's conservative. It doesn't look like Stefan Mucker is energising the lead Aston Martin in the way that Fred McAfee did, and, and maybe it is Stefan Mucker, his way of consolidating a lead. He doesn't have to push. All he has to do is not let the idea of Rene Rast run him down and the danger is that you overreact to a car bit by bit by bit eating into your lead but with what 41 minutes of this race to go uh, he is in a comfortable position it would only be something beyond his control maybe a situation where an incident on track would occur that you then have a safety car deployment something that you can't predict and that's you know really it doesn't matter whether you got one second or 20 seconds lead in a safety car intervention everybody then is closed back up Let's have a look at the order as they go over the line then. Mucker to Ras, the gap has gone up by eight tenths of a second, so the Aston is pulling away from the Audi once again. And then in third place it is this car, the number 13 Audi, in the hands now of Edward Sandstrom. So unless we get a safety car to bunch them up, I think those gaps are going to be pretty difficult to reduce in the uh, first part of the order. Stefan Mucker's last lap, two minutes and two seconds, against the fastest lap for that car, Really strong run by Mooka. Doesn't look it, but he's actually pushing very hard. The fourth place Ferrari has gone through, and then for fifth, number four BMW will be through there. Marcus Palter. So you can see how, over the course of the first two hours, the gaps have really widened. So, what is it? 48 seconds between first and fourth, and we're waiting for the BMW to come across start finish line. It's gone through. It's but gone it's through with the time. Over a minute. Uh, yes. Yes over a minute back from the race leader so if the race director is listening um, what can you find to put a safety car out for because we'd like the gaps to come down if they can a little bit but Marcus Paltler is pushing on it's six is Stephen Kane and he is pushing on and he is catching Paltler so there number 23 Nissan currently sixth that's got a chance of bagging fifth before the end of the race that gap's coming down the team manager of number two which is the uh, Belgian Audi Club team WRT Audi going to the race director, so either Vincent Voss or Pierre Giordone on their way up the stairs. But that's the car that's running in eighth place at the moment, Matt Halliday at the wheel. And where is seven? It's seventh, Alvaro Perez at the wheel. Well, Alvaro doing again a, a job to match that of Steph Dusseldorf in a car that was difficult and uh, we haven't seen it looking so, I would just say, fundamentally difficult to drive in the uh, event itself as it was in qualifying. But you can get it, you can see the way the car oh. is, is, is sort of rocking. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a rocking motion. And again, there, it's almost a fore and aft. Um, it, it is very strange. And of course, the difficulty teams have got everything is homologated. Once the season begins, you're unable to do development to find an improvement. So there's things, work in progress within the, the mechanical side of that McLaren that uh, could certainly give the drivers a much easier time. Somebody else that deserves credit is. Uh, Adam Carroll, Rob Bell started, then it became Nico Verdonk, now Adam Carroll, 10th in number 69. But that car was, again, really struggling in qualifying, and they may be disgruntled with their position, but they've plugged away and salvaged something out of this. And there is more to come, just under 39 minutes to go. They could gain yet more ground before the end. Well, Adam Carroll really shone at the tail end of the event at Monza, got a third place for the Gulf McLaren, and uh, had a big smile on his face, and that's always an indication that a driver knows he's done a good job. The sense of self-satisfaction, justifiably so, was all over Adam's face, and he is a yeah. racer. He I is a 100% racer. And he was pretty confident at the start of the weekend, but as the cars rolled out for free practice, then I think it started to hit home to the McLaren teams that this was not their weekend. In fact, somebody from one of the teams said to me, we're praying for rain, you know, and well, it's not come. No, it's not come, thank goodness not, and it's been a beautiful day here at Silverstone, looking resplendent as everything at Silverstone is just basically getting better by the season. The Pro-Am Championship class battle is raging on. This is the car that leads it, and it's Alex Buncombe at the wheel. It was, for whatever reason, a long second pit stop, and that car's dropped a long, long way down the order. Alex, we know, is quick, but when you lose, I think it was something like two minutes in that pit stop, it's going to be very, very hard to come back from there. And what it's done 
he's put it almost, almost a lap down on the leader. So Alex well, Buncombe leads the class from now the Gottfried Grasser Lamborghini and third in Pro-Am Richard Abra having taken over from Joe Osborne and Richard is a very quick driver he's won the Silverstone 24 hours here in the past with Mark Poole so Alex Buncombe into Stoke Corner and he's catching Adam Carroll at about two seconds a lap this is Gottfried Grasser in the Lamborghini going out of Cops Corner and that's another solid run by that car yeah, that's a big chunk of time that uh, Alex Bunker has taken out of Adam Carroll in the McLaren and uh, he will be up and past it uh, within a very short space of time at the end of the last lap. He was only 1.2 seconds behind and uh, clearly you can see he was right on the gearbox and there's a little battle as they come on to hangar straight. Clumps of car there is the second of the Gulf Racing cars, not the Adam Carroll driven one. So up on the inside goes Rene Rast. But again, four tenths lost on that last lap. The gap was widening. He's doing his best to peg it, but really he needs Stefan Mucker to have a problem now. And it's certainly not going to be fuel-related, is it? Because we know how good on the fuel economy the Aston Martin is. Now, 78, Gottfried Grasser turning his way out of club corner. And he is about half a lap up on the third-place car in the class, which is the Richard Abra Aston Martin. So, again, barring a disaster, a podium finish is looking pretty good there. In the gentleman trophy, Ahmad Al Hathi has got himself to the lead of the class from John Gore. So this could be quite a good day for Aston Martin Racing, couldn't it? If they have an outright win and the boss of Aston Martin Racing manages to get a podium finish in class as well, that wouldn't be a bad day. That's 180, the Richard Abra third place car in Pro Amp. Joe Osborne did that middle stint and Richard Abra has taken over now. Mark Poole, who is a, a very wealthy but quick amateur racer, did the first stint in the car and they've come up together, Mark Poole and Richard Abra, through Brick Car, through the Aston Martin GT4 Challenge. They were here last week in British GT and went very strongly indeed. Richard Abra, very quick driver there, is 69, Adam Carroll. And look who is up behind him. Alex Bunker in the Nissan has absolutely hacked away that deficit. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Nissan's just been running simply faster than the McLaren by over a second, almost two seconds. Now he's got an opportunity to look, try and go the long way round because he's going to have to do that. Adam's not going to concede the inside of the corner. And uh, Alex Bunker has had to concede that they got down into Stowe, but he's just got clearly a car that is quicker than the McLaren. Now down the inside into Vale, will Adam Carroll concede? He does, he knows when he's beaten. Tries to come back a little bit because Buncombe was slower off. Vale, but maintains the advantage now through club. Looking a little bit further through the field, Edward Sandstrom, I think, is under threat from the Ferrari in fourth place. The gap, well, it's just, in fact, it's increased. It's gone up to 3.2 seconds. Once again, the whole issue of traffic affecting what we see on timing and scoring as Alex Buncombe now thinks about who's next up. For 10, this is going to be, it's about 10 seconds behind the ninth place car. And ninth at the moment is Marcus Winkelhock in the Phoenix Racing Audi. So more teams running Audis this year in the Pro Cup. Traffic working its way up towards Luffield here, look, which includes one of those Phoenix uh, Audis. Indeed, that's the 16 Winkelhock car. And in the lead situation, the gap is up to over 20 seconds now. That's Jordan Grogor trying to find a way past 58 Christian Kelders, and he can't find a way through. They're on different laps, but the Porsche is in the way. Well, he tried up the inside going into Woodcut, never on. Then cut back to go around the outside of Woodcut. Not particularly a good idea. Eventually he gets it done somehow or other into cops through the Beckett's S's they'll go in a moment and John Gore's Aston Martin he just saw going out of shot running in 30th spot overall at the moment more driving standards flags are being bandied around we've got just over half an hour of the race to go and Christian Kelder's Porsche currently running in only 6th place in the Gentleman Trophy currently running in 19th place is Mick Asalo having his Blancpain debut Good to have him in the championship and he got this call on Thursday evening to come to Silverstone to drive for SMP Racing. Jordan Grogar there running in 31st place, going strongly. And the next target for him is John Gore, who is only a second up the road. There's the leader, Stefan Mucker. His last lap was a 2 minutes 3.9. Rene Rast's last lap was a 2 minutes 4. So again, the gap just creeps up a little. Yeah, and it's up now to 20 seconds. And Stefan Mucker has done it again, as has the two co-drivers in this lead Aston Martin. A, a very, very professional, as you'd expect from three top professional drivers, job. They've managed the traffic perfectly. 
and uh, they managed to get this Aston Martin to go beyond the one-hour mark in each of the respective driver stints. Stefan Mook is going to get short change, he's only going to, going to get about what, 47 minutes of this race. Plus, he'll be thinking about maybe the lap after the chequered flag, that might add up a little bit as well, but car looks great, driven flawlessly, managed the traffic, you know, good day, good day for the three guys in the Aston Martin Racing DB... What is it? DB... Vantage, Vantage GT3. Yeah, yeah. Now, the Aston, of course, is not one that's doing the whole season. The opposition might be quite chuffed about that. Now, let's have a look at the Gentleman Trophy. Mira Konopka and Akhman Al-Hafi back into the lead. It's a good racing going on in this class. And then second in the category is the John Gore field driver, uh, Aston Martin. But for the moment, the Porsche has a pretty decent advantage. Where is the Aston Martin? It's not yet on to hang a straight. You can see, therefore, that it's a big gap that the Omani driver has been able to build up. Goes a little bit wide through Stowe. Well, was that the alternate line, or was that just maybe <laughs> a concentration issue? Or was he trying to let the McLaren go by, which finally does go through? The surviving ART car, Mike Parisi at the wheel, 20th. Remember that that had a drive-through early on yeah. in the race when well, Antoine Leclerc... Well, certainly Mike Parisi would be indicating that he is wanted to come through uh, indeed. fairly quickly. And uh, in fairness, uh, the Porsche did give that car room. He didn't have to do what he did. He could have done it down in Vale, and there, McLaren is the Wainwright Merrick car and rejoining that's at Village I think it's had that spin it is gets going again Mike Wainwright behind the wheel one of the driving forces behind Gulf Racing and he recovers from that spin currently the car's in 34th position so accelerating now onto Wellington straight and goes down towards Brooklyn's once again we're on lap 71 here and the lead gap is almost 21 seconds and it looks as though this Aston Martin barring a disaster, has got the race there for the taking. It has gone bulletproof-like, trouble-free all weekend. In the meantime here, Marcus Paltola working his way through traffic. Paltola is hunting down uh, Daniel Zampieri in the Ferrari that's back down into fourth place. Now the pit stops have cycled through. Keep an eye on Stephen Kane, sixth place in the Nissan, trying to run down Paltola in the BMW in fifth. Stephen Kane doing strong laps. Well, was doing a strong lap now again. Paltala has reversed yeah. the advantage that Kane had gained. So uh, that battle, it's two, just 2.3 seconds between fifth place and sixth place. So that's up for grabs for Nissan and Stephen Kane. But not that far behind them and pushing hard as well is Alvaro Parent. And if he can get a clear lap, the Hexis McLaren could be looking at a place in the top six before the very end. Uh, that would be a great day. Yeah. I think for the team for Hexus, if that was the case, they will certainly have earned that sixth place if that is to be their fortune. The Hexus McLaren started 24th on the grid, so it was uh, not appalling. It could have been a lot further back than that, but it was still pretty good. This is the second place gentleman trophy class car, John Gore at the wheel. Uh, John first came to prominence in motor racing as a very quick and successful Caterham racer, won Caterham championships for the road sports at the same time as being a regional sales director for Walker's Crisps and life has changed a bit. He's now in charge of Aston Martin Racing's project and he drives big powerful GT cars rather than Caterham's but one thing hasn't changed and that is that he is still very rapid indeed. And certainly enjoys his endurance racing. Yeah, keeps an eye to what the customers are up to but then gets behind the wheel and he and Phil Driver have been uh, a double act through brick car for a few seasons and uh, John Gore turns his way now up through club and then the third place car in the class is one of the soft rev entries it's the number 10 Ferrari in the hands now of Le Patron because Jerome Policon has taken over from Gabriel Balthazar and then Maurice Ricci and so Jerome Policon is third in class now one of his lap times like his last was a two minutes six John Gore two minutes six as well but the Aston slightly the quicker of the two so once again, evidence that Aston Martins are very strong around here and it makes you a little bit sympathetic, doesn't it, towards Andrew Howard and the Beach Dean team because had they not had that gearbox issue early on, they should be well up there as well because you've seen that you've got Aston Martin leading outright, Aston Martin second in Pro-Am, Aston Martin second in Gentleman Trophy. The cars are strong. This is Ahmed al Harty, and he's just lost out to one of the Black Falcon Mercedes, maybe with contact. Uh, may have been contact, certainly had to put an opposite lock on coming out of uh, Lovefield, we just saw... Having had to make that reaction, don't know if there's any contact, doesn't look as if there was, but certainly the back end of the Porsche did momentarily step out of line. Well, it was Duncan Tappy that went past him. Let's see if there's a bang. 
Oh, oh no, traffic oh, ahead. Oh, dear me. And that was quite a save that by was, Ahmed al -Hathi. That was, I tell you, 81 written all over it. Yes, indeed so. Duncan Tappy storms past the Mercedes, and Alvaro Perad gets past the pair of them. Ahmed al -Hathi. Complete with his laundry bill, gets away with that, but uh, that was quite a moment. That was uh, a potentially race changing moment, I would have said. <laughs> that would have certainly de degenerated into a safety car intervention had it, uh, had it gone the way it had all the impressions it could have done. Yeah, accidents at Woodcut, you know, can, can bring different race results. Think of the 1981 British Grand Prix, John. I do, I do. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Let's, Let's have another, the, 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 have another look at this. On board. So somebody either misses a gear or slows. Well, it's, it's the, it's suddenly this car, which is one of the Mercedes, just suddenly ceased going forward, and it was just all of a sudden massive motorway slam on the brakes and dive left, dive right. It was a Duncan Tappy car that then picks up speed because in a moment you'll see it there comes chonking back past again. It's, I mean, he uh, he may have been something ahead of him as maybe the cause of it. Yeah. It's very difficult from the onboard camera to look through, but the, the principle of what I'm trying to make is when you're in a group of cars like that, as it happens in Woodcut, it's no use just looking at the rear of the car directly ahead of you. You've got to look through the corner to who is further ahead and try and read what's going on. And so many drivers do sucker for the, sort of the polarisation of the car ahead of them rather than using their peripheral vision as the McLaren dives into the pit lane. Yeah, in fairness to Duncan Tappy, he doesn't normally do funny things like that, and I think the car's coming into the pit lane in the background. I thought I got a glimpse of it pitting. The McLaren was Mike Parisi, but has Duncan Tappy got a problem with that Mercedes? It would account for why it suddenly slowed, as though it cut out almost. Anyway, the car was 25th when it last came over the timing line. And it stayed out, according to the timing screen, so persevering. There's Atman al -Hathi working his way now through the... Beckett's S is 26th overall. But where has the Duncan Tappy Mercedes gone to in all of this? Disappeared from the scene, hasn't it? So I think it has got a problem. It may even have not got to the pit in line yet, which is why it's not broken. It certainly the was a, a, the, probably the most unusual incident uh, we've seen so far in this race. And uh, no obvious explanation as to why. No. Well, this is now Harty now with a clearer road ahead the of him. The only thing that can, the only thing that can sometimes happen as a driver, miss your pipe, fumbling in the steering wheel, you can't flick a switch. Ooh, and again, running very wide. You know, the the stewards are watching, especially at club. I mean, it's a it's a it's a no-brainer for the stewards. They know that 99% of the guys are going to have minimum two wheels over the exit of club. And if you keep doing more than that, then you will get that inevitable drive through. So Ahmed al Hafti then, class leader, turns up towards the loop into the last 25 minutes of the race now. And unusually for a block pan race, at the head of the field, it's all gone fairly quiet. All the drama that we had early on has certainly shaped the race. Now you've got the gaps that have opened up between the cars. Daniel Zampieri is still pushing on, trying to close on Edward Sandstrom but he's not doing so because they are all so evenly matched. They're trading tens, lap yeah. after lap, but I mean, it's just, no uh, one's closing. Zeb and flow of yeah. traffic. Uh, everybody has now, I think, consolidated. Uh, the, the, the actual out and out racing has probably simmered down. Uh, Rennie Rass still chasing, but still basically 20 seconds behind the lead, Aston Martin. Sandstrom behind him, further 29 seconds. Zampieri, only five seconds behind Sandstrom, but is that a bit of smoke up at the... Oh, there's a yes, car is. smoking badly as it comes down into... Uh, uh, into Love Field, into Brooklyn's. Where's that? Is it there? Which car is that? It's the 57 Ferrari, Giacomo right. Petrobelli. And that is looking very, very uh, smoky indeed. indeed. He just caught Adam Carroll. I think he would like to find a fire station as soon as possible. He's gone through the gravel to get off the circuit. He was almost at pit in. Oh, he's now damaged. Yes, he's in. It's well, well a major fire behind the engine. A real engine, a fuel line engine fire. And he may well have found that fire station because there are two marshals there. Yeah. Just looking as well, has he put anything down on the circuit? So the 
car may have dribbled some liquid. That little yellow sign is one of the fast station points. The drivers will know about that from the driver's briefing. He got out of the circuit. The marshals can attack that. The other thing he didn't really want to do was come into the pit lane with a lot of fuel in the car when it was ablaze like that. So uh, the 50 Ferrari, Andrea Bertolini has had a spin, and that happens very, very rarely. Andrea Bertolini is not paid to spin in a Ferrari. <laughs> Quite. He is Mr. Ferrari in a GT racing. Put that in your diary. And damage damage has a that spin. to the left rear of the yeah. bodywork. It looks like there's some damage, and they're still trying to quell the fire in the sister Ferrari. Can't get the engine hood open. To, uh, we've got it now, finally. Yeah. Just be careful, boys, because th that oxygen and uh, fire are usually pretty combustible, but they seem to have got it under control. Bertolini possibly tagged into that spin, just going back to him. Petro Belli then, second race in a row, they're out. Brake problems at Monza. Engine fire at Silverstone. And then it's a mess when you put fire extinguisher into an engine bay, it is a mess. Yeah. Big, big disappointment then as Stefan Mucha leads the way. No question mark over the pace of the Aston. It leads Rene Ras, then it's Edward Sandstrom third, and Pierre fourth. And Marcus Paltola fifth. He was being caught a lap ago by Stephen Kane, but the gap has widened once again because of traffic. Stephen Kane is still pushing. But Alvaro Perez there is eight tenths of a second away from Stephen Kane. The change for sixth place is about to happen, I think, because as the cars now turn their way onto the hangar straight, the gap is coming down and down and down. And if Perez can get past the Nissan, he might even be able to have a pop at Marcus Paltola before the end. So there is Kane in the Nissan and Perez behind him. This, the battle for sixth, is starting now to really get close. Well, Stephen Kane at one point was actually running down the fifth place Ferrari, uh, uh, fourth place. Oh, Yes, fourth place Ferrari, and uh, that's all gone. Alvaro Perez is now the hunter, and Stephen Kane's going to go have to go defensive. So can Alvaro Perez, just over 20 minutes of this race remaining, continue the work and uh, snatch that place, that sixth place away from Stephen Kane? Still impressive the way that this car has come good. I know it's not going to win the race, but it's up in the leading positions now after all of the woes in qualifying. I don't think it's come good at all. I think just the drivers have driven around its around the problem, fundamental yeah. problem. I think the problem they've got is, is the problem they're going to have for the rest of the season. It will be worse on some circuits than others. Uh, and on a circuit like Silverstone, it's showing up in a negative fashion and not letting the drivers you know, exploit the potential of this car. But nonetheless, you have to work around with what you've got, and uh, all three drivers in the Hexus car have done a good job this afternoon. The car started 24th, the car it is chasing and catching started 5th. So it has been a good effort, come what may, by Alvaro uh, Perez to get up there, hasn't it? The good work has been done in the cockpit by yeah. the drivers working around the issues, staying out of trouble, using the traffic to their advantage, uh, while others around maybe had other issues, we don't know what was the case. I mean, Lucas Lewis certainly in the car Stephen Kane is now driving, did a good job to draw that car up into the top six and uh, ran very quickly indeed. Now Stephen Kane having to battle to uh, maintain his position. Alex Bunker still 10th, struggling after the slow pit stop, but leading his class, importantly, ahead of Richard Abra, who's gained second. There's Philippe Dumas, the man that runs Hexis, looking on as the McLaren turns its way through Beckett. This is where it got all bouncy before. It's still, still bouncing, bouncing, but it's not as exaggerated in qualifying when they were really loading the car up with fresh tyres and light fuel. It was it was just disturbing, that's all I can say. It was so, not a happy car. So the, the drivers have had to, and of course you, you do adapt, you do learn to work around the issues. It's not something they can physically change, the regulations and the homologation of items on the car. They are fixed for the season. So Parent turns his way out of club and powering his way now past the wing on the right-hand side. And how's he getting on in the sectors on this lap relative to Stephen Kane? In the first sector, he was down by a tenth. Marcus Winkelhock still pushing hard behind as well and chipping away at the Matt Halliday Audi, and he's got three seconds to make up for eighth place, so that's not resolved yet either. And there's a yellow flag still in the last sector because of the smouldering Petrovelli Ferrari. Now, Stephen Kane out of the loop. There's Alvaro Perez behind. At what part of the circuit is the McLaren going to be able to benefit on pace, or is all of this just going to be down to the traffic, I wonder? Well, the traffic will come into play, undoubtedly. And then, because the old, the old chestnut that arises is you catch the car you've been hunting, and then you get to within a second or so of it, and then you sort of stall out because the driver you've been chasing is able to manage the situation and then frustrate you, and then you find yourself having to make compromises 
along with all else that goes along. And suddenly you're running at the pace of the car that you're chasing down. And then the process of chasing it down, you could run a second or a lap or so quicker. And it's a frustration, but that's the skill of managing your own right, your own race. Steve Kane's lap was a two minutes four. Alvaro Perrin two tenths back. There is 62, which is Ollie Hancock in the Fortec Mercedes, running in 15th place. Fortec's Blancpain debut and going strongly. And right up behind is 25, back in the hands of Henry Hassid. Now, this is another battle for position. And remember, the BMW at the back of this gaggle had a puncture early on in the race, and they have now got back up into 16th place overall and fourth in class. Good drive. You know, again, intelligent use of the circuit. Don't push things, just be patient, it'll come to you. Another place about to be gained overall, I think, because the BMW is getting closer and closer and closer to Ollie Hancock in the Mercedes, right under the rear wing of the Mercedes under braking for Village then. Henry Hassid, former Porsche racer, trying to work out now which way to go. And just up the road ahead of them as well, he's got Fried Grasser in the Lamborghini, so that 14th could it be uh, under pressure as well. It's important really for Henry Hassid to get past that Lamborghini because that would put him on the podium in Pro-Am for third in class. Well, the Mercedes is going to be not quite such an easy task. Again, you can see just the BMW using a totally different line, hugging the curb very much earlier, trying to pick a bite in the tower where the Mercedes took the more traditional entry into Brooklands. And the outcome of it all is that the, that the BMW is now that little bit closer as the exit through Woodcote. Uh, but time's running out, only just over 15 minutes, 16 minutes and 16 seconds. And that's not too much time. Indeed, so if Hasid is going to gain ground here, he's going to crack on with this. Only Hancock's car, then the Mercedes just up ahead of him. The BMW blasts its way through the Beckett's S's, the TDS by Thierry Racing Team, that's come via the Euro Cup McGann Trophy into Blancpain this year. The car looking very competitive indeed, good middle stint done by Ludovic Badet to get the car into contention. The lead gap, 22 seconds now. Stefan Mucker continues to edge away from René Rast. And he, in turn, is 28 seconds up on Edward Sandstrom. And bearing in mind that 13 was ahead of one earlier, it's a big gap since those places have been switched around. Hancock stuck for the moment behind Gottfried Grasser. But for how much longer? Because he's got to push on with this, and he knows that if he can't get past the Lamborghini, he might well get done by the BMW that's tucked up behind. Just manage the situation. Don't let the stress get to you. Use your strengths and mitigate your weaknesses. That sounds all very easy, but when you're doing it in a race car with all the stresses and pressures, the crash, bang, wallop that's going on, you know, talking the talk is easy. Blue flag, big wave, so that should give Halliday, uh, sorry, Hancock, a little bit of hope that maybe the Lamborghini will respond, but look, BMW closes right up. And that Mercedes it's is going to go wide, it's but Hassid not able to take advantage of that. And of course, as they're battling, they're about to be lapped as well, aren't they? Because the Audi that is there behind them is a lap up on this little group down towards Brooklyn. So can Henry Hassid think about making a move against the Mercedes? Not there, he can't, because 13, Edward Sandstrom, is looking for a way through. And this is another reason why Sandstrom is losing touch with Rene Rast, because he can't get through this traffic jam. Oh, runs very wide and Luffield makes a mistake that will let the Audi... But well, he didn't, he ran very wide, then made a cut back, so I suppose the Audi would have been feeling rather frustrated that uh, what looked like a gap being made available suddenly disappeared as quickly as it did become available. Through Cox's corner now goes Ollie Hancock, back on the power, going up towards Beckett's. We are just under 14 minutes away from the chequered flag. And if things stay as they are, this will be the first Blancpain Endurance Series race ever that's been won outright by a British driver. We've never had a British driver win the overall standings. We've had class wins go the way of a Brit, but Darren Turner could be the first British driver to win outright, and in a British car on a British circuit. And a sunny Sunday afternoon. And as a proud BRDC member, he would be very happy to take a win at Silverstone, wouldn't he? Now there is Stefan Mucker going round the outside of the Gulf Racing Twins. He's pushing up. He is, and you know, that <laughs> had recipe for disaster all over it, but Stefan Mucha got away with it, and uh, both the Gulf McLarens were aware that there was the race leader coming through and uh, gave room, rightly too, they were being lapped. So Stefan Mucha continues, still got a 20-second advantage over René Ras in second place. 
It's just look at these situations and it goes trouble all over. In fact, it wasn't quite as bad as it looked when we picked it up initially, but now getting the replay. In fact, the overtake into uh, Village made it all very much easier for Stefan Mucha. It was just that that allowed the two golf cars to get much closer than they would have expected to be. And those golf racing cars, one lapping the other anyway, because Adam Carroll is in one, and he's 11th overall, and he's trying to find a way past the Mike Wainwright car that's 34th. So there are GT cars scattered around Silverstone after the rigours of almost three hours of racing. We've got 12 and a half more minutes to go, and Stefan Mucha continues to lead the way, but he did get held up a little bit on that last lap. The gap's down to 18 seconds now between him and René Rast. Edward Sandstrom is in third place, St. Pierre is still fourth, Paltola fifth, Stephen Kane is sixth, and Alvaro Perret 1.4 seconds back from Stephen Kane. He's lost a bit of ground as Andrea Bertolini tries to make amends for his earlier spin. He currently is down in 20th place, and that is sixth in class, Andrea Bertolini. Yeah, that is, sixth that in is, class that is not where I expect Andrea Bertolini to be. But that car has been slow all race. Remember we talked early on about Louis Machiels when he took it over, and it was a long way down. It hasn't really sparkled, the AF Corsa car, strangely. But again, maybe this just is not a Ferrari circuit. First 25 then, which is Henry Hassid still chasing on. Now, you'll see up the road ahead of him that now he is on the tail look of the Lamborghini. So he's found a way past the uh, Oli Hancock car, but now what is happening is that he's got himself onto the back of Gottfried Grasser. So if this changes, the BMW goes third in the Pro-Am Cup. Down through Vale, Henry Hassid, second at Monza in class, wants to be on the podium once again. And down they come into the braking zone for the end of Vale, now into club, back onto the power, and this is where drivers can, if they're not careful, run a bit too wide over the kerb, and Hassid does exactly that. You know, you've just got to think that if you're getting warnings, or your team is aware that many drivers have been given warnings, and some of them drive through some stop go penalties for exceeding the track limits, don't, don't push the envelope. No. You know, the difference in speed off the corner running up into Abbey is marginal and you really can't pass but he dives down the inside into the loop and uh, almost almost forces contact and that again lets the Audi slip through as well with a bit of luck as they come into yes Audi gets through as well so the Audi moving itself through the traffic but Henry has seen in the BMW then with that brave move goes third in Pro-Am now is he going to be able to do anything about Richard Abra before the end he is something like 11 seconds back Need to look at the lap times. Last time, two minutes five versus two minutes five. So on that pace, no. But with a clear road ahead of Henry Hassid in ten minutes, he can bring the gap down. But I don't think he'll go better than third in Pro Am. There's Ollie Hancock, then in the Fortec Mercedes car, running in the Pro Cup, and in 16th place. This is the replay. John, talk us through it. I just want to watch and see. He gets yes, he just basically came through village, then just simply dived down the inside and looked forced. The Lamborghini to run wide onto the dirtier part of the racetrack. And uh, there's a little bit of luck and judgment, I think about 50-50 there, because you can't control the car ahead of you. You hope that the driver sees you when you make that lunge. When you make a lunge from quite a distance behind, you've got to expect cooperation. And then in the end, the cooperation came, and he took, oh, got that position cleanly, albeit with about a fag paper between them. So now Henry Hassid pulling away, look, from the Lamborghini, and Gottfried Grasser is about to go a place down against Tommy Hancock in the almost anonymous Mercedes. Only the championship decals are on that Fortec car. Budget still being sourced for the rest of the year. But the team masterminded in Blancpain by Trevor Foster is on a good maiden outing. 16th, could be 15th by the end as the leader is again in traffic, trying to work his way past Maurizio Mediani's Ferrari who tries to nibble back at Stefan Mucker and this is the last thing he needs. Well, you, you, you get into traffic, but there's, there's not a race between these two cars. That is the race leader lapping slower cars and all of a sudden it's like a war. And Stefan Mucker comes down the inside, tries to force his way through and, uh, well, the Ferrari should have conceded. I'm assuming there was going to be blue flags waved and then starts to have a little nibble of Mucker slightly over Rand into the first part of Luffield, then tried to come back onto the racing line and found the inside almost partially filled by Ferrari. Well, Mika survives, and he's got eight more minutes of this. He's coming up as we have a Ferrari that's off at Cops. Is that a left rear, or is it just the angle? It's hard to tell. There's a yeah. left rear tyre. I think it's all right. I think it's just a driver error. All the tyre debris that's been junked and spat to the side of the road. 
So the Ferrari continues. I think it's one of the M10 cars. I was about to say that Mucker is coming up now on the Joneses to lap them in the Mercedes, which is in 28th place overall. So we're into the last eight minutes of the race. The lead gap is 18 seconds, and then second to third, 31 seconds. So the two Audis ran out of the same team that were in the reverse order, having switched places. The gap really has widened between them. There goes Jordan Grogor in 88. Heading up towards Village then this time around. And to the inside line he goes. And this is for position. 26th place, Ronnie Latin. Look in the Audi on the inside line. Jordan Grogor around the outside. The McLaren looks like he's got the pace to do this. And right around the outside. Yes, good move. Jordan Grogor goes all the way around. He gains the place. They both run wide. But the McLaren takes over. 26th spot now. So good stuff from the McLaren driver. Jordan Grogor up to 26th. But 12 months ago, he wouldn't have been able to race like that because his inexperience would have shown, but he's developed a great deal in 12 months. And that, good move. Yeah, I mean, it's just, again, track position and uh, don't, don't, don't overreact. And uh, he did a good job. It was a good bit of clean motor racing between those two cars where it could have also ended up in tears. Down to Stowe comes the Delahaye Racing Porsche, which has lost out on track to 77. Oh, smoke coming from that. that. Is that yes. contact bodywork or is that something more serious? For Stefan Wintenberger, Porsche. Early in the race, remember, we saw that Porsche leaping over the kerbs at the end of Vale and looking a bit random. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure there's something catching in the rear. I don't know, there's tyre smoke off the bodywork or whether there's something more serious, but certainly looks like as you lean on the left rear corner, yeah. we'll go back to the race leader with six minutes or so of this race remaining. And again, Mucker, he does have this habit of liking to run really close to cars he's lapping and uh, shaving in the occasions the door mirror off which he cares now to forget about but uh, all happened here a number of years ago but still running strongly running right now in the last lap of 205 pretty much the pace of the field Sandstrom fractionally quicker on that last lap but just simply it's just where you catch and you've it's even on a circuit like Silverstone 3.6 miles you can drive for maybe three or four laps and there's virtually no traffic, and then all of a sudden you come on a swarm of race cars. And Alex Bunker is still chipping away, leading the Pro-Am Cup. The charge that he has put in is an impressive one. It's not actually helping in terms of an overall position, but that's not really what this car is about. That car wants to win the Pro-Am class, and it looks like it's going to happen because with five minutes to go, I know they've had trouble in whatever sense in the pits for whatever reason they've lost time, but it's on for a class win, and this is the gentleman trophy class leading Porsche, Ahmad Ahati at the wheel. And that car running strongly, Miro Konopka, who is a quick gentleman racer, has... Uh, done a good middle stint in the car but the Omani driver really doing the lion's share of the work and it's noticeable isn't it that every time he's been behind the wheel the car has been in the lead of the class we've had a change for second in gentlemen trophy as well by the way Jerome Polycon now is ahead of John Gore so it's Porsche Ferrari and Aston in the gentlemen trophy and that kind of is what Glockpan is all about with different brands all being able to have good results and trading places this for fourth place now has got Zampieri and Marcus Paltola right up behind him and that Ferrari is losing pace. It was 1.3 seconds ahead of Paltola at the start of the lap and now Abby Paltola, the Finn, looking for a way by. He can't do it there, but it's game on and that BMW is so much quicker but the Ferrari is wide enough. Zampieri with really sharp elbows, keeping him at bay. To the outside of Village goes Paltola, he's done it, has he? Yes, but he's on the wrong line for the corner. He gets oh, squeezed he over the curb. He, no, he, no, he was forced. The Ferrari forced the BMW over the curb, it just ran the BMW off the racetrack. Now that was something that uh, is maybe beyond what is considered sporting. It was defence. Certainly the Pantala had a, a good run, went the long way around and tried then to get advantage into, into the loop. And uh, the Ferrari denied it in a very forceful manner. Yellow card, in your opinion? Uh, I would certainly be taking it out of my pocket. Right. Wouldn't okay. necessarily short. But if he does it again, definitely. Brandish it at him, OK. I mean, yes, he did squeeze him over the curb, but they were level at that point, weren't they? So Marcus Paltola uh, dealt with fairly um, ruthlessly by Daniel Zampieri. Brutally. Brutally. He's got to do it all over again, then, as the Finn. But why is that Ferrari losing pace all of a sudden? His last lap was a two minute seven. Here it is again, John. OK, now, at that point, the BMW was marginally ahead, then in the corner, the Ferrari got it back. But look. Closer. That is not the natural racing line, that is the defensive racing line. And Pantala had to simply get out of the throttle and almost half off the racetrack. 
as they continue this battle, three minutes remaining. So Paltalook will have another go at this. This has become the best fight on track. And a goodly crowd at Silverstone watching this. We'll see the cars now accelerating their way once again down through Vale towards Club. And this is Stowe Corner, first of all. Then they'll go down through Vale. And we're looking at the battle going on for fourth overall and fourth in the Pro Cup. At the start of the lap, it was three tenths of a second between them. But can Paltola do anything about the Ferrari? Well, he's right under the rear wing then as they now work their way up through club. He's going to have another go, is he, as they swing through the right-hander. He needs to be right under the rear wing and there may be challenge at the same part of the circuit as he did a lap ago. Up they come then now towards Abbey. Again, Paltola looks to the inside line, but again, there's no way through there. He turns his way to the right, then the left, and heads up now towards Village. This is where he made the move a lap ago, but this time Zampieri is wise to it. But again, Paltola tries the outside line. This time they get a touch, and the BMW gets tagged sideways. And again, Paltola goes off the road, but that time it was with even more help. Daniel Zampieri, same corner, different lap, kind of the same result. He stays ahead, but by increasingly forceful methods. On to Wellington straight they come. And Paltola thinks, well, third time lucky. What does he do now? He's going to try and get the time back somehow. Here's the replay of it coming out of farm. To the outside line goes the BMW. Paltola breaks as late as he can. It was a bit touch and go, but Zampieri goes deep into the corner because he braked too late. And there's the contact that ends up just forcing Paltola off the road again. A minute and a half remains as they come over the timing line. Where on track is Stefan Mucker? There he is, he should squeeze one more lap out of this, which in other words means effectively two more laps for those cars that were fighting, the one they're on and the one that Mucker will convert into the last lap. There's less than a lap time left in the race, but he should get back to the start line within a minute. But Stefan Mucker for Aston Martin Racing, he's looking as though the win is going to go his way. He turns his way now then, out of entry, onto Wellington straight once more, and as he does so, the... Aston Martin Racing mechanics in the pit lane and all the other teams getting ready to cheer home their cars. But there's going to be one more lap to run because Stefan Mucker can't really drag this out for 43 seconds. Two more corners, even though he's in traffic, so he's going to have to go around once more. But on home soil, what a day for Aston Martin Racing. Fastest in qualifying. They haven't led every lap, but once Darren Turner got past Lucas Odoniev, there's just been no stopping this car with 26 seconds to spare, onto the last lap now goes Stefan Mucker. He turns his way through Cops Corner and he's onto his last lap now as he heads up towards Maggots. Less than a lap time is left in the race. So three hours of Silverstone then will be won seemingly by Aston Martin ahead of Audi because they're going over the timing line now is René Rast, having taken over from Lawrence Vantour in the car that was started by Stefan Ortelli. And then behind, you've got in third place, the Edward Sandstrom, Frank Stippler car that was started uh, by Christopher Mies, but that's sort of dropped away in this last stint. Whether there's a problem, no, not, but it just has not looked all that pacey coming out of Luffield. Just up ahead there is the car that's third in Pro Am, namely uh, Henry Hassid and Ludovic Bade's BMW. So you've got third in Pro Am ahead of third in Pro Cup here. Over the line goes Edward Sandstrom, the Swedish driver. It went pretty well here last year, although in a race that started wet and dried out at Silverstone at this time of year last season. It was all about the Mark VDS BMW at the last hour. There was just no stopping Maxime Martin. With half a lap to go, Stefan Mucker turns his way now up through Abbey. There's Darren Turner with Fred McAvicki watching on. And looking pretty content with all of this. Two thumbs up from Darren. Yeah, so a good Blancpain debut for him. Fred McAvicki has won in Blancpain in the past, but driving McLarens. And there is 97. The Aston Martin Racing Vantage GT3 comes out of entry down now towards Brooklands. And Darren Turner makes his way to the pit wall, ready to cheer home Stefan Mucker, who's done a shortish stint. It was about 46 minutes to go when he got on board the car. He's only had to really consolidate the lead given to him. Hard work done by all three of them. But in different ways, Darren Turner battling early on to get the car in the lead. Fred Makaviki battling to maintain the gap and build on that gap. And Stefan Mucker battling to bring it home and keep out of the way of all the traffic to score victory at Silverstone. Aston Martin wins round two of the Blancpain Endurance Series. Stefan Mucker, Darren Turner and Fred Makaviki take the race win. And not only is Darren Turner being able to celebrate being the first uh, British driver to win outright, but that is also the first outright win for Aston Martin. Over the timing line now comes 
Rene Rast takes second place with Stefan Ortelli and Laurence Van Tour. And then in third spot is going to be the Edward Sandstrom, Chris Mies and Frank Stippler, Audi. The classes will also resolve themselves over the next few corners as well, but it's going to be Alex Buncombe's Nissan to win in Pro-Am, ahead of Aston Martin. There's the third place car, coming up towards the line is 13 then, so Edward Sandstrom ahead of the zampieri Paltola battle. Which way is that going to go, Ferrari or BMW? When they went onto this last lap, it was 0.2 of a second between them, so we wait to see whether it's going to be 44, the Daniel Zampieri Ferrari, or number four BMW that will come through next. So we've had the third place Audi home. So what do we get, Ferrari or do we get BMW? Let's see, there's the chequered flag. And we wait and we wait and we wait to see if, as Alex Buncombe arrives up at Village, it's a change on the line for fourth place because Stephen Kane has come through for fourth, fifth goes the way of Marcus Paltola, and sixth was Daniel Zampieri, so it's all changed around on the last lap. They've just come across the timing line in that order and a real shuffle right at the very end. Uh, Alex Buncombe comes through to take what is going to be 10th overall and a class win. He takes the chequered flag now, or well, will do in a moment. Where is he? In the traffic at Luffield. Yeah, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, but more importantly, the change for fourth place has gone the way of Nissan. Stephen Kane fourth by two tenths from Marcus Paltola, from one tenth uh, from the Daniel Zampieri Ferrari, 7th Alvaro Parent, 8th Matt Halliday, 9th Marcus Winkelhock, and 10th now is Alex Buncombe. But as I say, it all kicked off out of our view on the last lap for 4th place, and a real shuffle of the three positions, 4th, 5th and 6th. Well, 57 started, something like 48 take the jacket flag, and victory for Aston Martin with a winning margin of 20.9 seconds. The Gentleman Trophy is won by Ahmed al Hati, the Omani driver, with Miro Konopka from Jerome Policon, Gabriel Balthazar and Maurice Rishi, and John Gore and Phil Driver taking third in the class. And the drivers will make their way shortly to the podium. There's the Porsche with Ahmed al Hati celebrating victory. He's raced at Silverstone on the national circuit in the past in Carrera Cup outings he also had a go in the Super Cup race here last year at the Grand Prix so it's not a circuit that's totally new to him but there is the car of the day quickest in qualifying and untouchable in the race once Darren Turner worked his way into the lead there's just been no stopping the Aston Martin Racing Vantage GT3 Stefan Mucker brings it home Darren Turner and Fred Makabiki can celebrate with him they will, in a moment or two, head up to the podium. Lots of applause for the car as it arrives back. And Stefan Booker opens the door, clambers out of the car, and big smiles, big thumbs up. And a job well done. Fred Makaviki is there to congratulate him. So too Darren Turner. And Stefan Booker goes straight to the team to congratulate everybody. Great job by the mechanics. Great job from him. And he needs the requisite block pan logo on his overalls before he's allowed anywhere near a camera or up to the podium. But we'll hear, I'm sure, from our winning drivers very shortly. John Watson has made his way down to the Park Ferme area. And so. Stefan Mucker, Fred Makaviki, Darren Turner win round two of the Blancpain Endurance Series. It's the first Aston Martin victory. John Watson is there to join the celebrations. Fred Makaviki, Darren Turner and Summer, Stefan Mucker, congratulations. Looked easy. Uh, it was not easy, I think so. It was a really nice job of everybody and uh, the team did a great, great car and every time a good pit stop and my two teammates was incredible today. Darren, you made history today. First. British driver to win a Blanc Pound Euro event, I understand. Oh well, well that's uh, even uh, a better way to finish the day. It's been it's been an amazing weekend. You know, it's our first time in the championship, uh, getting to understand the tyres and everything else. Team's done a great job, got the car up to up to speed. Stefan, brilliant at the end. 
Freddie in the middle and uh, you know I had a bit of fun with Lucas in the in the Nissan at the beginning so uh, a great weekend for everyone at Aston Martin. Well done Darren. Stefan you got short change there the car is so efficient at fuel you only got about 47 minutes well done. Yeah thanks I mean it was a great race as Martin did a great job and also my teammates Darren did a very good job at the beginning to get in the lead and Freddie just uh, built up a bigger gap so it was uh, not easy at the at the end it was still quite a hard fight uh, and also we had to understand the tires but well done to everybody we are really really happy. So when are we going to see this Aston Martin again, Darren? Uh, we need to go and ask our boss and say, can we have a bit more, please, and <laughs> come back again for the next race. Excellent job. Well done, guys. First Aston Martin win. First time a Brit has been at the top of the overall podium. And Darren Turner then will be making his way with Fred Makaviki up the stairs in a moment. Second place then, Rene Rast, Stefan Ortelli, and Laurence Van Tour. And all the Audi drivers getting together, all smiles. Rene Rast doing a good job. Been a winner here in the Porsche Super Cup in the past. And let's hear then from our second place drivers because John is down there and he can talk to Stefan Ortelli, Laurence Vantour, and Rene Rast. Rene, how was that finishing second? Happy with it? It was quite uh, calm for me, to, to be honest. Um, uh, they both did a great job. The team did a great job. We had perfect pit stops. And I just had to uh, save my, my second position. I had no pressure from behind. and. The Aston Martin was so far back, that uh, so, so far in front that I couldn't uh, couldn't catch him. So for me, it just uh, was important to yeah, stay on track and uh, save the points. Stefan, you had the opening stint. Looked very, very busy out there for those first 20 laps. Yeah, I think it was really nice. The, um, the Nissan is quite wide, it's quite big, and the Audi looks very small behind. And when we are really close, we lose a bit of downforce. But the, the fight was very nice. And we have to say the Aston, they were better today, and uh, Marco was... Uh, also flying on the second stint, he did a big gap and we couldn't come back and uh, uh, all together, I mean, it's really nice that for Lawrence and René and myself, we are second. It's uh, the best result we could have today. Laurent, well, a typical drive from you, drove the wheels off the Audi in your stint. Yeah, it was, was not so easy, conditions were not, not easy to drive the car, but we were quick if we could, could nail it. And was some problems with people who were ignoring blue flags, which was quite disappointing, but in the end, yeah, I think we arrived second, uh, we can be very happy on the podium and uh, it's a good championship point so and a great job from Rennie and uh, and my uh, my well-known teammate Stefan <laughs> so uh, really happy about it. Well done Belgium Audi Club, congratulations. Thanks Alex. Thumbs up from the drivers, there's Alex Buncombe who uh, takes off his helmet and his hands device and his balaclava and then gets the stick and tape off his ears to get the intercom out because Ordonez in the background with his Pirelli cap on and it's Peter Pizzera there, the German driver who will in a moment, go with Alex up to the podium as the Pro-Am uh, winners after uh, another very good drive. So they head to the podium via the steps of the media centre, the Jimmy Brown Centre, Silverstone, named after the man that ran Silverstone for many, many years, so successfully. And there is a glorious sight in the pit lane as everybody's car, effectively under part fair make conditions, sits in the pit lane, teams not allowed near them for the moment. But it is, again, just awesome to see so many cars. We should be on for roughly the same number for Paul Ricard and then perhaps another 20 again for Spa. That's a race not to miss last weekend in July. If you've never been to the Spa 24 hours, it's a much underrated event, well worth going to. And so at Silverstone, there is uh, a number of cars to be collected. There are chunks of rubber all offline. The marshals have put the fire extinguishers back by the side of the track for collection, and celebrations continue down in the pit lane. Let's hear from the Pro-Am winners next. It's a win for Nissan. Pro-Am winners, Lucas Ordonez. Great start to the race. Yeah, great start, uh, great car to drive, and really enjoyed the first in uh, fighting with Aaron in, in, with, in the Aston. And yeah, great, great to finish in the, in the podium again, first in class. Job, my teammates, and uh, really, really happy. And yeah, now looking forward for Le Mans, but really, really good motivation for for the big race. Peter, a little bit nervous before the start, but you look much happier now. Yeah, fantastic. We have uh, pole position in Pro AM, uh, fastest lap in race, and we finish now first position in Pro AM. It's perfect. <laughs> Excellent, Alex. Another bunkum charge, and uh, well, you got the result you came for. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it. Uh, 
didn't feel like the Blancpain series out there. There wasn't many cars out there to play with, but no, it was really good. I enjoyed the stint and just had to push, push all the time. But I, you know, they they kept saying we had a, a fairly reasonable gap to P2 in the class, so I knew I just had to, you know, keep it in the fours. But uh, yeah, just like to say thank you, you know, thank you to the team. They've done a fantastic uh, job all over the weekend with the car. You know, Ricardo with the setup in quality was absolutely bang on. We nearly got the pole overall, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come back fighting for sure. Well done, guys. Congratulations. Thank you. And that was despite a couple of slow pit stops that seemed to cost quite a chunk of time. And it could have been a different story, even better, but a class win is the main aim. And the Bob Neville run team has achieved that. So the drivers then make their way to the podium. And Atman al -Hati, talking about first-time winners, uh, very definitely the first Omani winner, and in the person of Mira Konopka, the first Slovakian winner in the Bronkpan Endurance Series. So it's the first time we've had a uh, driver from those parts of the world on top of the podium, and it's also the first time ARC Bratislava has had a class win in the championship as a team. So as the podium is dressed, ready for the overall classification, drivers are there. We have the three podiums, because overall is the same as uh, Pro, and then you've got one for Pro-Am, a gentleman trophy, and Stefan Mucker along with Darren Turner and Fred Makabiki will be up there in a moment. That's the throng of people beneath the podium, fans, VIPs, media, teams, and so where everybody is ready, because collating drivers for podiums is not the work of the moment, because they all go off and talk to each other, or go and talk to the team, or don't do as they're told, uh, then hopefully we'll get everybody there. So we're just about good, I think. And Aston Martin taking its first victory in the championship. We had Hexis run Aston's in the original season of the Block Pam endurance series but they were never race winning cars despite their efforts and so now drivers make their way out onto the podium Edward Sandstrom along with Christopher Meese and Frank Stippler taking third place now for second place again from the Belgian Audi Club Team WRT Stefan Ortelli, Laurence Bantour and Rani Rast smiles all round although a gap of nearly 21 seconds can the end and Aston Martin Racing is going to make its way to the top step of the podium represented here by Stefan Mucker, Darren Turner and Fred Makaviki. and if you want to be a real anorak about this for an Aston Martin win the winning time was 3 hours 1 minute 36.007 seconds what better for an Aston Martin Racing for Darren Turner along with Fred McAviki and Stefan Mucker, the British national anthem. And as I say, Darren is the first man to have won outright as a Brit. We had Duncan Tappy, a class winner at Navarra last year, but overall, Darren makes history. It's the first Aston Martin win in the championship as well. And so, as the trophies now are presented to the drivers, third will go with first uh, in reverse order. So Christopher Meese, along with Frank Stippler and Edward Sandstrom, will get the trophies, and then Laurence Vantour, Stefan Ortelli, and Rene Rast will go next in the higher placed Audi on the podium. And then, of course, the Aston Martin drivers will get theirs last. They are on the top step, ready and waiting. And handshakes all round. The drivers straight after the podium go to the press conference, and the podium is then made ready for Pro Am and for the Gentleman Trophy podium ceremonies. So now we have Darren Turner receiving his trophy, Fred McAviki and Stefan Mucker likewise. Great reception for them, and Darren making his 
Blancpain debut. I'm sure it's the same for Stefan Mucha, although we have had Fred Makaviki here in the past winning. And <laughs> John Gore uh, takes over the mantle of being the team manager, so he gets on the top step, even though he was only third in his own class. So John Gore is the man in the blue and black overalls, who is third in the Gentleman Trophy, but as the uh, boss of Aston Martin Racing, he gets on the podium to represent the team and to get a trophy himself. The winners also get the block pound clock, which has to be divided three ways. That, I suspect, may go on the wall of Aston Martin Racing. However, Darren grabs hold of it for now and thinks, I can go and fit on my wrist, but it. Champagne is sprayed and a messy podium at Silverstone is the result after three hours of round two of the Blanc Pan Endurance Series. The next stop, remember, is Paul Ricard, but then from the flat French circuit to somewhere completely different, Spa for the 24 hours, and this year it's five, not six races within the series. It ends at the Nürburgring, 1,000 kilometres in late September. Right, drivers have gone through the champagne and have a drink themselves now. So, as the top three teams will have a swig from the bottle and then go to the press conference even though we talk about gaps of 21 seconds between the top two and 35 seconds between second and third right the way through they have driven flat out the traffic has played a part the natural pace of drivers and cars has played a part as well and so the pro cup after 86 laps three hours of racing no safety cars won by Darren Turner, Fred Makaviki and Stefan Mucker from Stefan Ortelli, Laurence Vantour and Rene Rast and then Frank Stippler, Edwin Sandstrom and Christopher Mies third. On the last lap, high drama. Lucas Law, Stephen Kane, Peter Dumbrecht get fourth. Marcus Paltola, Nick Katzberg and Henri Moser fifth. And sixth goes the way of Zampieri, Ramos and Rigon. The rest of the Pro Cup cycles through but sort of ignore anything really from 16th and down because those are cars that didn't make it to the end. We know about the the uh, Petro Valley Ferrari going up in smoke, others with problems and damage as well. So Pro Cup done, Pro Am is going to be next as the podium is made ready and that is a class that has been uh, successfully taken by Nissan, first Nissan victory, uh, not in the championship because Nissans were winning in GT4 in the original series uh, of Block Pen, but for this year, it'll be a first for a GT3 Nissan. In the Pro Cup, this is how we look in the championship. Ramos, Rigon, Zampieri now ahead by five points of Mies, Sandstrom and Stippler. But with just one race down and a win, Makaviki, Mucha and Turner now run third. McLaren having a pretty torrid time at Silverstone. That costs their drivers points accordingly. But now in Pro-Am, drivers make their way out onto the podium with the third placed uh, team being there, which is, sorry, the second place team, I should say, Joe Osborne, along with Richard Abra and Mark Poole. Henry Hasid and Ludovic Bade are already there, so that means now that out comes Peter Fitzsierra, Lucas Ordonieff and Alex Bunker as the winners of Pro-Am. So Nissan, Aston Martin and BMW all represented on the podium. And Bob Neville is the man in the black overalls who joins on the podium. It's his team that runs the Nissan, and Bob has been loyal to Nissan. They've got a good working relationship now. Bob goes back to the 1960s as a uh, mechanic and team manager and now celebrates a win for his team. Aston Martin Racing, it's now for Team RJN because even though it's a Japanese car, it's very much a British squad that runs it and Ludovic Bade, then Henry Hassid receive their third placed trophies, then for second spot it will be a team new to Blancpain in terms of the drivers, Barwell is the team that runs the car and we've seen Barwell before but Richard Abra, Mark Poole and Joe Osborne have done a very very good job, the Aston Martin taking second in class 
and if Joe Osborne's pace in that car and Richard Abra's likewise doesn't attract the attention of John Gore with his Aston Martin racing hat on then there's no justice because that was a cracking effort by both and then for the top step of the podium trophies now for Alex Buncombe, Lucas Ordonev and Peter Pizzera a win for Nissan GT Academy Team RJN and proof that couch to cockpit works Peter Pizzera in only his uh, second international race if you like excluding the Dubai 24 hours as part of a championship this uh, is a class winner and so uh, he celebrates victory Bob Neville gets his team's trophy and the block pan clock to go with it and I suspect that he's going to be very proudly now uh, on the wall of his workshop so the drivers will have their trophies in the air for the last few photographs and the champagne is already opened. Henry Hassid is the man that jumps the gun a bit there and starts to saturate everybody. But the photographers get what they need and then the celebrations can continue on the podium. Is this going to be the first of many a Nissan win? It's been a mark threatening to score victory, but it has only just arrived, but in style. And the way that Stephen Kane's car went over that last few few laps of the race suggesting that the Nissans have made another big step forward this weekend right the Barwell Aston drivers are jolly good with this champagne Abrapool and Osborne have their own into Nissan fight on the podium whereas you've got now the Nissan drivers celebrating as well and when you're a class winner getting doused in champagne doesn't feel so bad let's just run through the Pro-Am Cup results Lucas Ordonev Peter Pizzera and Alex Buncombe take the class win from Mark Poole, Joe Osborne and Richard Abra. Henry Hassid and Ludovic Bade third from Gottfried Grasser, Harry Prochik and Gerhard Varaza. Khamed Al-Masoud, Charles Bateman and Matt Bell fifth and a subdued Nick Homerson, Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini sixth, two laps down after dramas early on that cost them time. Ninth in class, Duncan Tappy in a car that had a drive through early on, 15th in the class, the Mike Wainwright, Andy Merrick McLaren that had a spin just behind the Anderson Jensen Ferrari that had a stop-go penalty for not responding to a drive-through and 18th in class, the Beach Dean Aston that had that lengthy gearbox problem early on in the race. So that is how Pro-Am looks and of course a retirement very early on with damage, the Lamborghini of uh, Mark Hayek and Peter Cox. So the Gentleman Trophy won by Krocka and al -Hati. First victory for both, the head of Maurice Ricci, Gabriel Balthazar and Jerome Policon. And third in class, again a good day for Aston Martin, Phil Driver and John Gore, the head of the second software Ferrari of Blanchemin, Bobalik and Guilla. And the one that didn't go very far, sad to say, was the John Hartshorn, Carrie Moge, uh, Marlena Brogi, McLaren that retired very early on indeed. There's John Gore with Phil Driver as third in the Gentleman Trophy. They're going to be joined in a moment, get off the top step, they say, uh, by Maurice Ricci, Gabriel Balthazar and Jérôme Policon, who will make their way now up onto the second step. Another good day for the Sofrev team, getting more points within the class. And then for the top step, it is going to be the class winners of Miro Konopka and Ahmad al -Hati. Another race of high drama at Silverstone. The next stop for the Blanc Pan Endurance Series will be at Paul Ricard. The Jack Nichols in the pits from John Watson and from me, David Addison. Then it is going to be goodbye from Silverstone and we look forward to round three of the championship at Paul Ricard.